We're going to get started in five minutes. So if you want to grab some food and find a seat, we'll get started in five minutes. So are you learning to write legalese? <laughs> Man, your stuff was like almost hard on the head. I'm oh, like, yeah, wow. Sorry. <laughs> really good. <laughs> I, I learned it as I was. I learned it as.
All right, we are going to get our piece that meeting started. Thank you for everyone for being here tonight and for hanging with us as we allowed all our members to get here. Really excited that we have the entire uh, committee here with us tonight. Um, Vadim is joining us by phone, and Britt and um, Steve are going to be joining us just a little bit later, but I thought it would be great if everybody could just go down the line, introduce yourself if you're sitting on a committee or a chair, if you could just state that committee uh, as well. Patrick Nolan, I'm the uh, chair or co-chair of the subcommittee with peop or for people with mental illness. Elliot Young, I guess I'm working on the subcommittee, subcommittee on race, ethnicity, and other. Um, Amy Anderson, and I haven't picked a subcommittee yet. Lucky and Drury, co-chair. Good evening, Marcia Perez, uh, race, ethnic, and other subcommittee. Lakeisha Dumas, co-chair, peace out. Andrew Kalick, member of the steering committee and the settlement agreement and policy committee. Yolanda Salguero, uh, co-chair of the youth subcommittee. Sam Sachs, chair of the race, ethnicity, others committee. So uh, we have quite a packed agenda tonight, so just want to let everybody know it will go probably right up to 8.30, if not a little bit after. Uh, so have patience with us tonight. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Co-Chair Lakeisha to do our opening moment of silence. All right, uh, moving to uh, subcommittee reports, uh, steering committee. Steering committee, um, our last meeting, we basically talked a lot about the recommendations that are coming up tonight. Um, looking at, we spent a substantial time looking at the recommendation process, which is on here under the agenda and the recommendations. 
but we're not going to um, go through tonight just in the interest of time, but just looking at how do we streamline the process. We, um, I feel very confident that we have a process that works for both the public to bring recommendations to PSEP and also for PSEP members to get those um, passed through and just kind of have more of an understanding of what the roles are in both of those. And that's something that we've been <clears throat> working on for the last several months. So um, feel confident about that. So we iron that out. Um, and then just um, spent a, no, the rest of the bulk of the time talking about the uh, COCO report that's going to be presented tonight and just looking at strategy around that and what are, um, where does PSEP fit into that whole process between the city, um, the Department of Justice, and PPB. Uh, so that was that, and then setting the agenda for tonight and coming up with um, what was important out of all that. Oh, and then also... Um, debriefing the PSEP retreat, which was a very helpful two-day process where PSEP members just got to um, kind of reflect on everything that we've been through in the last six months or so, uh, new members and things of that nature, and just kind of realign ourselves and figure out what our, our plan is going forward. So it was a um, much-needed time, and we're looking forward to doing more of those uh, more frequently. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that, Andrew. Nope. Said it all. All right, uh, subcommittee, people with mental illness. Uh, hi, uh, we had a great meeting. Uh, we discussed our two new recommendations that we are bringing forward tonight, and that pretty much covers it. Thank you. Um, race, ethnicity, and other subcommittee. Hi, um, my name is Sam Sachs, again. Um, October, was it October 3rd? Fourth. Fourth. October 4th, we had a subcommittee meeting at Highland Christian Church where we invited the community uh, to come together and hear from the gun violence reduction team. The gun violence reduction team did a presentation, a PowerPoint of um, who they were as the gang violence reduction team to who they are today, um, kind of going over to give information to community members because there's been some confusion. There's a lot that has changed, not just the name, but their role in the work that they do. So they did a, a PowerPoint presentation. I think everyone from Captain, Lieutenant, and uh, uh, Chief Deputy Shear was there. Um, everyone was there and available for uh, to answer questions. So it was very informative about um, what the work that they do. We then heard from um, three community members that were affected by gun violence and one officer uh, from Portland Police who has worked on both the gang enforcement team and the gun violence reduction team uh, since, you know, I think maybe 15, 20 years and talked about what he has experienced and relationships he's built. Uh, we then had um, a, a group discussion and heard from community members that were able to express their concerns about the work that's being done and what they would like to see done moving forward and it was a very um, felt it was very transparent and open we did not discuss any of the data because they did not have the data at the time they were still gathering it preparing it but they um, said that they would come back at a later date to bring the data and to have another discussion I think there probably wasn't time to do both because data um, needs a, a lot of attention. But I thought it was a really um, informative meeting and it was good for the community to be, be there. We need to get more community members there, more people that are affected by gun violence and uh, at those meetings. And the gun violence reduction team said that they are open to having more of those types of sessions where um, community driven community members can come and they can explain what the work they do, hear from community members. So um, I want to open it up to the other committee members if they had they want to add because it was a pretty uh, powerful, impactful meeting. Marcia or Lockheed, if you want to say anything. Sure. Yeah, we were able to come up with some recommendations out of the uh, feedback, and we talked about those at our last meeting. Um, but one of the things that I found was really important, I think that there was a lot of power in the room as far as um, dialogue goes. Um, and one thing that I, I think is really important is that we evaluate the process. So um, I've solicited feedback from folks that attended um, as far as the location, appropriateness, time, 
um, certain things to be informed by the community as far as being trauma-informed and sensitive to, to different walks of life and accessibility. Um, I also have am working with the gun violence reduction team to set up a time to debrief and hear about what um, their thoughts are and how mm. we could come back. And, and I think that was a very uh, preliminary uh, early, pro you know, in, in the early stages of doing something really great in the long term. So I'm excited. I thought it was really great. Um, and I, so far, the feedback's been positive. So we, we are moving forward. And hopefully, w once they do have the data, we'll be facilitating another um, listening session and would love to see uh, a greater outcome f from communities that are impacted by gun violence. Yeah, that's, that's it for mine. I don't know if you want to. No, that's that's it. I think summarize. Thanks for um, the recommendations. Do you do you have those with you? No, they're not yeah. completely drafted. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Okay, can settlement and agreement policy committee. Sure. So um, we had a couple of agenda items this month. The first was talking about how uh, to move the Truth and Reconciliation Commission model forward. As some of you recall, we recommended that the Police Bureau incorporate a Truth and Reconciliation model into its community engagement plan. Uh, the Bureau did that, um, but also mentioned that a, a Truth and Reconciliation model cannot just include the Bureau, it has to include many other uh, community stakeholders, which, uh, which we agree with. And so one of the things that we were trying to do at this meeting was uh, identify certain stakeholders who we could invite to a future subcommittee meeting and talk about what comes next. Uh, what do we need to know? Uh, who needs to be at the table? And how do we make this uh, something that's beyond just pen on paper uh, and, and real? Um, so that's one of our key goals. We also discussed a couple of uh, additional policy issues uh, that are uh, sort of front and center uh, in a variety of of places, including Portland, uh, one of which is facial recognition technology and the use of facial recognition technology by both public and private entities. Um, there has been discussion of this at the city council. Commissioner Hardesty has been particularly outspoken uh, about the use of this technology. And so what we'd like to do again as a subcommittee uh, is bring together uh, some relevant stakeholders as well as anyone else in the community who, who wants to take part uh, in a discussion of the, the pros and cons and issues that facial recognition technology uh, brings up. So uh, we will be, again, scheduling that for a later subcommittee uh, meeting, and, and all of you as well as the general public will know when we calendar that item. And our last thing was talking about the, uh, the compliance officer report that we'll hear about shortly, so uh, a lot more to come on that. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Uh, youth subcommittee. Thank you, Lakeisha. Um, our committee met on the 13th from 3 to 5, um, so we had a good two-hour meeting. Half of our committee wasn't there, though, um, which kind of brought us to reaching out to our admin um, staff, asking if we had any youth um, applications. And so at this time, we're still accepting uh, youth applications to try and increase our numbers for our board. Um, we recap um, the retreat for folks who attended. We, we reviewed the mental health committee recommendations that um, they're asking for us to vote on tonight. That took up a bulk of our meeting. Um, and then our survey, which is supported by Portland Public Schools, uh, we talked about that because we now have been asked to send over six additional documents, which we did not have. Um, so we are going to work on those six additional documents, one of them which includes a copy of approval from an institutional review board. Thank you. Thank you for all the um, subcommittee updates. I'm gonna turn it back over to Lakiana. Okay, so we're gonna move into our Cocoa Town Hall. This is um, one of the parts of the settlement agreement where um, PSEP is supposed to have a quarterly town hall with the uh, compliance officer. Uh, Dr. Rosenbaum. So he will be presenting um, their quarterly report um, that has to do uh, with compliance issues. Um, so we'll invite him up. The presentation will be up here. If you would like a paper copy of the um, presentation, you can find it up at the front where the sign in is at. Um, PSAP members can probably just turn around to face the presentation or look on from uh, the paper copy if you have that followed by the presentation. We will uh, open it up to piece up yep, comments and questions. 
and then open it up for public comment. And this will last around an hour. Thank you. Dr. Rosenbaum. Thank you. <clears throat> Is this mic on here? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, uh, I'm Dennis Rosenbaum, the compliance officer, and uh, thank you all for being here and uh, putting up with me talking here. Um, I will try to run this uh, PowerPoint slide as I'm talking as well. Um, let's see if it works. No, it doesn't. Where do we, where do I point this? Which direction? No, it's working. Oh, it is working, it's just slower, okay. Um, so basically, uh, I'm going to uh, cover this, uh, kind of quickly go through it. Uh, there's quite a bit of findings. Yeah. If we can hold the questions till I get done, then we'll have plenty of time, hopefully. Um, there's two different areas our report contains. Uh, for, there's, um, first of all, there's an overview of compliance with paragraphs in the settlement agreement that were approved and received substantial compliance in 2018, but were not revisited in 2019. So we cover force, community-based mental health services, crisis intervention, and employee information services in that category. We update those. And then I'll give you a quick status report on the paragraphs where uh, the city or PPB had not achieved substantial compliance by the time of our last report, uh, July 1st, and that's training, accountability, and community engagement. And then we'll, we'll finish off with those, and it's a good place to, to end with the community engagement. Uh, I'll refer to the Portland Police Bureau as PPB just to be short and I'll move quickly through this. So let's go to the force uh, slides here, uh, three paragraphs. Um, we found that the PPB has continued to enforce the two force directives, 1010 and 101010. Uh, these directives instruct officers and supervisors about their responsibilities for all use of force events. Uh, for instance, it uh, they cover the requirements pertaining to force reporting, supervisory responsibilities, and lethal force. Uh, related to force reporting, we've reviewed their FDR, FDCR report, which is their force data collection report, very carefully. It does capture all the key elements that we feel are essential uh, to get a candid, complete account of force. Um, after a force event, supervisors on the whole are doing a good job of reviewing these force decision makings by officers. We've looked at the force reports ourselves, and they're interviewing witnesses, making decisions as to whether any directives were violated by the officer using force. Uh, and also our analysis shows that these after action reports by supervisors are being completed 99% of the time within the 72 hours that they're required to be completed by. Uh, and they have to notify uh, Professional Standards Division, uh, PSD, in cases of serious use of force, uh, force against persons with mental illness or suspected misconduct. And then PSD actually is required to include all the same material that is in the after action report that supervisors would do. Our analysis shows that the, uh, these, these processes are fairly complete and accurate. We've done a lot of sampling of different cases. Um, Finally, paragraph 71, uh, the PPB is required to maintain their supervisory levels, and we use span of control as a metric here, which we think is good. And currently, it's five to one, so five officers to one supervisor, and we consider that acceptable, and they've maintained that throughout these five years. I should say for those of you who are new to this, including maybe some of the PSEP members, that this is, our fi this is five years we've been doing this in Portland, just so you know, and we've spent a lot of time uh, and I'll come back to that issue in a minute because uh, in terms of progress being made. Um, let me move on to force to custody. This gives you, we tracked the use of force levels over the past three and a half years and they've consistently maintained a force to custody ratio about three to four percent, which means for every custody, arrest, detention, force is used about three percent of the time. So 97 percent of the time it's not being used. Uh, and this is sturdy stable even after they've expanded the list of actions that are defined as force. In the last year, they've expanded that to include more minor incidents of, of force, such as resisted handcuffing. Um, so the big picture, though, frankly, it's not listed here, but force is, is a rare event. For those of you who don't study this, it's about one-fourth of one percent of all the calls that come in. And in terms of mental health, which is the main focus of the settlement agreement, um, 
there were nearly, in 2018, where we have complete data, there were nearly 26,000 uh, cases that an officer defined as a mental, someone in a, having a ment perceived to have a mental health condition. Uh, of those 26,000, uh, 0.7% ended up with the use of force. So 99.3% of those officer contacts with people having a mental health condition did not result in force. So I, we, I just want to put that all in perspective because sometimes we lose track. Now, of the cases that did involve force with a person with mental illness, uh, when force was used, it tended to be at the lowest level. There's four levels of force in the police bureau. Level four uh, is, uh, for example, um, 69 percent of those uh, of all the force incidents were level four and 47 49 percent were control against resistance where a person is somehow resisting something and the officer has to control them uh, and and resisted handcuffing they refused to put their hands in front or behind them so they they assist with that but there's no no hitting no spraying no tasering no shooting none of that just just want to be clear that you understand what's going on with a lot of these cases um, Community-based mental health services, okay. Now this is clearly a debated subject and I look forward to hearing more about it tonight, about the adequacy of the coordinated mental health and addiction services in Portland and providing uh, enough walk-in centers. Um, but I do want to stress again from our perspective that the crux of paragraph 88 is that the primary responsibility for a comprehensive mental health system falls under the purview of the state and community-based <coughs> mental health service providers. So we, as our, in part of our job, and I'll say this throughout my presentation, we look at what the settlement agreement says. We're responsible for the legal terminology there. You could debate whether this should have been in there or how it should be handled, but we look at did PPB and the city, have, have they done what they can within their power? Uh, we said they've continued to act with their partners in the overall delivery of community-based mental health services. For example, the Behavioral Health Unit, BHU, does include state, county, and local representation, mental health service providers, and persons with lived experience. And again, paragraphs 89 and 90, the requirement of the settlement agreement places the expectation on the community care organizations, not on the Portland Police Bureau. So our hands are kind of tied in terms of who's responsible for this stuff. Um, and these include creating a drop-off center and establishing of the committees. Um, where possible, I think PPB has, uh, has assisted in bringing these requirements to fruition, including participating in the transportation subcommittee and the prior CCO subcommittees. Now, we acknowledge that this community concern about the Unity Center, center and CCO subcommittees um, but again, it's an issue of who, whose job it is to deal with that, and I look forward to that discussion. Um, so um, we believe that in this case, they've made a reasonably good attempt uh, to partner with folks and to uh, serve on these subcommittees. So we can come back to that. Um, the next one, let's see here. Well, I guess I can't, there we go. Crisis intervention. A number of paragraphs here, again, critical to the settlement agreement. The Behavioral Health Unit, BHU, and the specific teams within BHU continue to comply with the requirements of the settlement agreement. For example, BHU's leadership structure conforms to paragraph 91 with the high-ranking lieutenant overseeing those committees, those, those teams, the Enhanced Crisis Intervention Team, ECIT, BERT, the Behavioral Health Response Team, and uh, Service Coordination Team, SCT. The Behavioral um, Health Unit, BHU, collects, utilizes, and shares data and information in a manner that conforms to the settlement agreement. There's a number of paragraphs that do that. They have an analyst there that's doing some serious work. Uh, for instance, they continue to utilize the mental health template. That's a form the officers fill out when they think someone, uh, there's a mental health uh, crisis or situation. Uh, whenever an officer interacts with someone. Now, PPB uses the template to identify those who come into regular contact with PPB. That's three templates within 30-day period and make referral to the Behavioral Health Response Team, or BERT. And they have implemented a regular audit function uh, of the mental health interaction data. 
For instance, they recently identified a slight increase in police contacts among BERT service recipients 60 days after service. And, and although this is still below the level of, uh, of interaction that occurred before BERT started, which is some evidence that the BERT program, we've reported that previously, is, is helping. Uh, but the BERT team is now uh, follows up with their clients prior to the 60-day time period. So there's more intervention there. Uh, as part of the Behavioral Health Coordination Team, PPB and other entities within the mental health service delivery system continue to share non-confidential information when an individual has repeat contacts with PPB or present, represents an escalating concern. PPB has maintained its relationship with Multnomah County Crisis Line by sharing BERT referrals with them. The BHU Advisory Committee also continues to meet regularly and provide recommendations to PPB. The Advisory Committee members include representatives of all areas of mental health response. Um, I don't know which way I'm supposed to be pointing this thing. There we go. All right. More on mental health crisis. Um, I, the crisis intervention remains a core competency of PPB officers, with all officers receiving a minimum of 40 hours of pre-service training and annual in-service training. Um, additionally, the enhanced crisis intervention team officers continue to, to receive an additional 40 hours of training prior to becoming an EC, ECIT officer. I do want to stress, for those of you uh, in a national perspective, that's way above what other departments do. Uh, behavioral health response team officers are also required to attend the ECIT training. Um, let's see, the service coordination team continues to serve those with high rates of criminality and addiction. Finally, in April of 2019, BOEC at the Bureau of Emergency Communication, or your 911 center here, conducted an in-service training that reinforced the notion of when in doubt, send them out, which is means send out the ECIT officers. Uh, we've been arguing all along that these officers are specially trained and have special skills to handle these situations, and uh, we would like to see them sent out more, and in fact, that has happened. So they trained, did an in-service training on the dispatchers and the call takers, and after receiving that training, we noticed an increase in the number of ECIT calls uh, compared to or a year earlier, as well as an increase in the proportion of mental health calls that were dispatched as ECIT calls. So in sum, we maintain that PPB has substantially complied with the paragraphs within the crisis intervention section of the settlement agreement. Please remember that this was the primary focus of the settlement agreement, and in many ways, we would maintain at this point in time, after five years, that Portland actually is a model for other cities. The PPB mental health model, not necessarily the whole citywide model. Um, because I, that's a whole nother issue. All right, let's move on to um, employee information. Employee information systems essentially look at any potentially problematic trends in an officer's use of force, and if that officer exceeds a certain threshold, such as three or more complaints in a six-month period, a threshold that would, it would trigger a case review for that officer. Uh, it took a few years to get this really this requirement in place. Uh, that we pushed pretty hard for this, but now PPB has maintained its EIS thresholds and added some. There's eight events now that can trigger a review. Uh, our analysis is they've been managing those reviews pretty well. They send a lot of alerts on to supervisors, which can be overwhelming at times, but they've figured out a system to do that. Um, PPB also continues to utilize a risk management approach to identifying potentially problematic officers. By this I mean they're throwing lots of variables into an, an equation and looking at what factors predict various outcomes. Uh, for those of you who remember your statistics class, like a normal distribution, most people are in the middle and out at the tails are the people that, like, in, you know, 95% <coughs> of us fall within one standard deviation and 99% of us fall within two standard deviations of the mean. But if you get, uh, I mean three standard devi deviations, but if you get out, so here they're looking at who are the officers who are three standard deviations from the mean? All right, they're in the 1% that are that far from the mean and th those that are two, 5% and, and th what do we know about them and what, what factors predict their behavior? So this is the kind of thing that I was hoping they would do, and they're now doing, 
and uh, it's uh, finally I'll just say that PPB again conditions of settlement employees EIS administrators they have two now and they've created a an EIS manual that memorializes all this for future training of uh, administrators so nothing's lost when people move around uh, now I'm going to quickly update you on sections in the settlement agreement that um, we're not in substantial compliance last time we wrote our report, which was the end of June, on the second quarterly report. So we had to uh, update those and focus on those paragraphs in the settlement agreement that were not in substantial compliance. Uh, officer accountability, paragraph 121. You know, in the past, we've noted that both uh, the PPB's Internal Affairs Division as well as the City Auditor's Independent Police Review, I IPR, have struggled to complete the administrative investigations of officer misconduct or complaints of misconduct within the 180-day timeline uh, from the settlement agreement. And this, this has presented a big challenge for both groups. And However, I do want to say that both groups have worked very hard in the last year, uh, held many meetings that we've attended, a lot of those we've been in, all involved in this. They've introduced significant managerial and procedural changes in the way they do these investigations such as case management strategies that now hold weekly meetings. Uh, they share mailboxes to the increase efficiency. They review these overdue cases. Why is this case running so long in the investigation? Let's see what the issues are. Uh, they work in coordination with BHR, which is sometimes involved uh, human resources as needed, and they provide advanced copies of materials to unit managers who that was slowing up the process. And there, are, there are other things as well. I just list a few. And these changes were then memorialized in a new standard operating procedures or SOPs that could be read by current and new employees down the road to help uh, standardize um, this a more efficient investigatory process. And you can see the difference. As it turns out, compliance with the 180-day timeline for completing administrative investigations of misconduct has gone from only 50 percent were completed on time in 2018 to 94 uh, percent in the first quarter of 2019. So that's a pretty impressive increase. Um, also the stages, I do have a map here, there's different stages of the investigative process and we summarize these stages and analyze them. You can see that over the last year from like um, that the percentage of cases that were overdue at each stage has gone from almost 40% uh, down to single digits, 7 or 8%. So again, more evidence that they are cleaning up the process, making it more efficient, and getting the investigations done in a more timely manner, because that's also fair to the complainant as well as the officer involved. Um, training. That should say paragraph 84. I don't know why it says 81. I apologize for that. Um, PPB's only remaining requirement for substantial compliance here was paragraph 84, which requires them to increase their use of role-playing scenarios and interactive exercises. From the very start, I've been pushing PPB to follow best practices and evidence-based policing to utilize a, what I, is a procedural justice framework in training, which would really help prevent uh, escalation of tensions and reduce the need to use force to gain compliance by community members. Procedural justice in a nutshell there, I list the four basic principles. Voice means the officers should give the community member a voice and let them talk and explain their situation and not make just commands and orders. Uh, they should respect them, show respect and dignity for everyone in the community. Neutrality means sh make decisions that are unbiased not based on gender, race, sexual orientation, anything like that, and demonstrate trustworthy motives that uh, the community member can trust them because they're showing concern for their welfare or uh, their situation, which can occur through empathy or compassion or various other things, suggestions and help, tips like that. For years, I've argued that lecturing, however, in the classroom about these principles is not enough. Officers need to practice the skills implied by these principles, just as they practice firing their weapons and other things. Practice self-defense. They need to practice these social skills. Uh, PPB now has done that successfully as part of the fall in service. Recently, they introduced this training scenario that was pretty sophisticated and allow officers to practice their procedural justice and communication skills and receive individualized feedback during a debriefing session. 
And that's really important, individualized feedback. We observed this training and have concluded that it satisfies the requirement of paragraph 84. Now, going beyond the requirements of the settlement agreement uh, under the new chief, uh, they've institutionalized procedural justice as a core component of their training program rather than a standalone piece. So, in other words, it's integrated into nearly all of their classes at the training academy, which I give them credit for. And, uh, and the impact is starting to show up in the citywide surveys. Uh, satisfaction with police contacts went up pretty dramatically from 2016 to 2019, for example, overall with most people, not with everybody. Okay. Community engagement. You've been waiting for this all night. Okay. Uh, and the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing, or PSEP. Paragraph 142, we've monitored the, the formation and functioning of PSEP since mid-2018, and since your first meeting in November of 2018, which is almost a year now, uh, PSEP has met regularly and provided multiple opportunities for community input on police community relations. At this point, we've narrowed our compliance focus to key elements of paragraph 142, although PSEP did not have to substantially comply on the there's a massive list in 142 to achieve substantial compliance, even though you're free to do that. Um, here are the key tasks that I listed on the slide there and the, and the outcome. So PSEP has held regular meetings, subcommittee meetings, and town hall meetings with community input, such as this one. PSEP has a working relationship now with PPB, providing input on PPB's annual report, metrics, and community engagement plan. From our perspective, from my perspective, PSEP has the bylaws, the group values, the diverse membership, the leadership, and the city's support needed to function as a legitimate body. Based on our observations, PSEP also has the critical self-assessment skills needed for survival and adaption to its environment. By, for example, uh, the group has prepared a report on the challenges they face so that they're not just naively moving ahead here. They know what some of the issues are, and I know they've discussed them as well in the meetings, and are not afraid to be honest and take a critical look at the obstacles they face. In addition to these activities, PSEP has streamlined the recommendation process to make it more accessible and transparent. Based on all of this activity and more, the group's resilience in the face of inevitable challenges such as turnover and meeting attendance we have come to the conclusion that PSEP is functioning as a legitimate body for community engagement, and we can have assigned them substantial compliance with paragraph 142. Okay, one more. This one is about the city and the police bureau side of the community engagement component, paragraphs 145, 146, 150. Based on progress in the second corner, those are the ones remaining. And uh, we, here's our assessment. On, one, on 145, PPB has developed a working transparent relationship with PSEP and has developed a reasonable community engagement plan with input from PSEP. And they have taken PSEP's recommendations seriously. We should note that the community engagement plan was adopted by the Portland City Council on October 2nd, 2019. Paragraph 146, PSEP presented the community survey results I'm sorry, PPB presented the community survey results at PSEP's July 23rd meeting to inform the work of PSEP, and they also used the results to inform the development and implementation of the community engagement plan. For example, they noted that the community expressed concern about excessive force against persons experiencing a mental health crisis or communities of color. In response, they have beefed up their plan, the, their their community engagement plan gives increased attention to implicit bias training and procedural justice. They're also currently working on training modules for cultural competency for all officers and are creating a pool of community members to help with training. I think that's important to actually get community members involved in training. I know Lachian has done some of that and some other folks have too. They're planning additional councils for community involvement and they're exploring a PSEP's recommendation on truth and reconciliation. Um, but this PSEP, the, but the community engagement plan of PPB is a plan. It, it's the chief wants to continue this dialogue with PSEP and others to refine that thinking. Paragraph 150, P, 
PPB has released its annual report in a timelier fashion than it did the year before, as we had recommended and PSEP had recommended, uh, and presented it in each precinct area and at the City Council meeting. In summary, because of this work, PSEP has, PPB has substantially complied with paragraphs 145, 146, and 150 of the settlement agreement. All right. Now, as I bring closure to this, I want to ask what does substantial compliance mean, since that's kind of a debated subject here. Um, most simply, it means the city and PPB have complied with the legal terms of the settlement agreement. But if anyone thinks we're just checking boxes here, I spent the first two years fighting about that issue. I'm not a box checker. I am a person who believes in documenting the quality of implementation. We spent many hours focusing on that, and uh, we held the city's feet to their fire to ensure high-quality implementation of changes. And that was painful in the first couple of years, but we finally got through that. Also, substantial compliance, however, does not mean that PPB is flawless or that there, there's no room for improvement. Uh, in, uh, in many areas. I'm sure there, there is. This is not an end. It's a beginning of a process. Um, and uh, thanks to the settlement agreement, I believe the Police Bureau is much further down the road of organizational improvement uh, and fun functioning more as, a, as a, what I call a learning organization. I've said this before. Learning organizations are ones that have systems in place where they're constantly collecting data about themselves internally and their external environment. And they're auditing themselves and they're evaluating their programs and they have feedback loops built in so that they can adapt and adjust easily and quickly to their environment. And PPB has over five years that we've been monitoring this is much, much better at that now. And so they have the feed feedback loops built in, they evaluate, they have EIS to look for which officers are way outside the mean, they have evaluations of their training programs, they audit all their force reports. Um, uh, I could go on. So there's a lot going on like that. There's a bunch of audits set up. Uh, but anyway, let me just finish here. What are the next steps? The Department of Justice, DOJ, will submit their report later this year, soon, sometime, in the next month or so, I can't say. It. I don't know. Uh, but DOJ, it's important for me to note to you, they're the final authority on whether the city has achieved substantial compliance with the settlement agreement, not the COCAL. We're independent. This is a strange arrangement in Portland, unlike some other cities. But we are independent of them. They're independent. You guys are independent of them. But they have the final say about what is substantial compliance. They do listen to us, and they we collect a lot of data. and look at a lot and assess a lot of factors. Now, once achieved, the city's required to stay in substantial compliance for at least one year. So this isn't over for those of you who think we're walking away from this. Uh, we will evaluate compliance during what was called the maintenance year and report whether the established remedies are in fact durable. They have to have durable remedies and remain in place at the same level of commitment in 2020 that they were in 2019. Again, we're not checking boxes. We'll do an in-depth analysis. We'll report any discrepancies or deviations to the Justice Department and Judge Simon. Uh, paragraph 178A says that substantial compliance means that the violations must be, quote, minor or occasional, not systematic. So we will have to keep an eye on that. Uh, I can just a footnote, if you guys want to read any of Sam Walker's work, a colleague of mine, He's looked at reforms in many different cities. These things are beneficial. I'm making the argument that PPB is a better organization than it was five years ago. Um, but they can also fall back. Some cities fall back. So you do, it, you do have to uh, keep an eye on it. My point, our job, uh, my, our job is limited and defined by the courts. I don't think the job of PSEP is. And um, I want to close by just making a couple comments on the resolution to defer uh, substantial compliance that they, uh, that, uh, and I didn't know about this until today, so my comments may not seem as informed as they could be. But I do, first of all, on a positive note, I do like the instinct of the PSEP to hold uh, PPB accountable to a high standard and, and to, uh, you know, have uh, high standards as to what would be uh, excellent policing. 
Um, I guess, though, my first impression is that uh, pushing back on compliance uh, when we've already done this five years of work is not really the best way to go. I think that, and I would say that we have been in agreement with DOJ and they've been in agreement with us on most things. I know Dan out here in the audience will say we disagreed on some things. He keeps records of this. But generally, I would be surprised if DOJ reaches a lot of different conclusions when they do the official statement here in another month or two. Uh, so we're not that far apart. So I think my, get, my feeling would be you can do that, and I encourage you to do whatever you need to do, believe me. Uh, but I think it might be better to look forward and ask the question, what can you uh, achieve? You know, how can you achieve the outcomes of greatest interest to the PSEP? Uh, and you don't, I'm not saying you have to live within the confines of the settlement agreement. You don't. You, you, you were appointed by the mayor to do whatever you, you, you think is important. The settlement agreement is one of your tasks. Um, Chief Outlaw has made it clear that she's open, has an open door on this draft community engagement plan. You know, what dialogue do you want to have with her on, on that and, and what, what are the various ways community engagement can go? What does that look like? So, and I, I guess my last thought would be at some point we have to pass the baton to you guys and to the city, the communities. And, and uh, uh, so I would encourage you to look to yourselves in the community and not COCOL or DOJ that it's time for a community voice to take the lead and not outsiders. So thank you. <clears throat> oh, I should just say the, the last slide. Uh, if anyone has feedback on our report that they don't get to say tonight, or you, uh, feel free to email it, at, email it to us at that email address uh, by November 4th. Thank you, because it's a draft at this point. Thank you, Dr. Rosenbaum, for that thorough um, presentation. We're, we've got two sections in this now. We're going to have um, PSEP feedback, and then we're going to open it up to community feedback. Um, what I'd like to do is start on either one end or the other, and we'll just go down the row um, and give everybody a, roughly two minutes to make any comments or feedback, and that'll just kind of streamline the process. So I don't know um, if, uh, Patrick, do you want to start? Well, probably should we start with it. You want to start with there? I'm good. Um, yeah, I'm going to actually start with um, Yolanda just because uh, Steve and Britt are just jumping in here. And yeah. if you if you would like your turn to come after, you can just say pass for the time being. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment on the aspect of comparing PBB to other um, agencies or on a national level, I appreciate that distinction. So that way we're um, knowing that we are doing a better job than other folks. Andrew. Thank you, Doctor. One question on what you've written here for paragraph 100. Um, you mentioned that when there are calls that meet the ECIT criteria, an ECIT officer responds about three quarters of the time. Um, but that the lack of response in that quarter is rarely due to an e ECIT officer not being available. In, in fact, that's only 6% of the scenarios where an ECIT officer doesn't respond. What accounts for the other 94% of the circumstances? Do you have a, a se sense of that? Well, uh, actually, Tom, are you still on the phone? No, he wasn't. I am still on the phone. Um, Tom knows more about that than I do. I think that uh, they were not dispatched um, by, they were not sent out by their supervisor. Tom, do you want, or we may also ask, uh, I'm not sure, do you want to comment on that? I'll put you on the, what happened to his? Sir, could you repeat? Oh, it, it, it has to do with the uh, ECIT calls that were not dispatched. Uh, there's about, what, 25% right. where they were not sent out. And there are people here from the police bureau that may be able to respond to. Do you remember what your analysis of that? Sure. The short answer is if there is no ECIT Hold on one second. Hold on. What we have a? Hold it Oh, hold it near the mic, yeah. Okay, if there was no ECIT officer available, 
then they then no ECIT officer would be dispatched. Um, but I think uh, the situations that you're also referring to is when no ECIT officer arrives on scene, which also may be that uh, the incident was resolved prior to an ECIT officer being able to get on scene. Um, higher priority calls where the uh, sergeant called off the ECIT officer. So it's not that 25% that there's no ECIT officer available. In fact, I think it was only 6% when there was just no person, no ECIT officer available. I think this is a question. Maxine's here somewhere in the audience. She asked, <laughs> she covered this in her story, I think. Did yeah. had said there are times when the call is completed before the ECIT officer gets out. It was called the incomplete call, I think. Y yeah. There I think with the Mary two. Um, some of those calls were, yeah, w we're not sure exactly all of them. I, I don't think we have a, a complete answer to that question, but uh, we can look into that more. Does anyone from the police bureau want to respond? Oh, yeah, we've got a deputy chief here. Uh, maybe respond. Do you have a microphone? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Reeve, Portland City Attorney. The mo the majority of the ninety four percent of the twenty five percent. I don't know the exact numbers right now. I do know that the majority of those calls, an ECIT officer is in fact dispatched by BOEC, but often. Remember that all of our officers are CIT trained. Often an ECIT officer will be dispatched, but the CIT trained officer that gets there first is able to handle the call and the ECIT officer is canceled. That's a high percentage. That right. makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. A lot of the regular officers feel they can handle these calls. Right. And so, uh, and they do handle the vast majority of the mental health calls. Uh, so ECIT is called in a smaller present and they're they're handling the ones where someone's life is in danger somebody's threatening somebody it's a, the more serious ones for the ECIT and like I said there's a lot of mental health calls that aren't you know 26,000 like a year go ahead I'm sorry thank you thanks Tracy Lakeisha okay Marcia um, I, I appreciate with the implementation of the training that there's um, role playing. It wasn't clear to me um, if if the entire bureau w got that training, if everybody's are cycled through that, or if it was just uh, specific units such as the behavioral health units. So if you could clarify. Yeah, sure. So everybody did get that. That was required in service training for all officers. And and I think to the point of um, being a national leader. And what we do, I think uh, Portland, Multnomah County is a national leader in best practices, but um, I would I would extend that we can't, uh, that's not sufficient for um, compliance in my opinion as far as, I, I think we have the resources to do, we are an, a model um, agency um, here in Portland, and so I think it's really important to, to live up to that standard and continue to do as best as we can through integrated uh, procedural justice. And, and I wonder, um, through the employee, I forgot, I wrote it down somewhere, um, info system, if, how are we measuring um, uh, the use of procedural justice or implicit bias training effectiveness on, on officers who are not doing gross over, overt um, uh, use of force is issues in the community? So how are we doing that on a day to day before it escalates? So uh, for the average officer, I mean, there's always potential citizen complaints, right? So they have that availability and they look at that. Um, but, and the, the reverse is also uh, receiving commendations, compliments from people. That's kept in their files as well. This, uh, this system now, they're, they're, they're required to record a lot more information than they used to. Uh, but I think, uh, that my preferred strategy and one that I've recommended for years and I'm very pleased that Portland is starting this uh, and that is the contact survey. So that community survey that you are all familiar with, there was a component of it where it asked, have you had any contact with the police officer in the last year? And if they did, they ask about these kinds of procedural justice things. Was the officer respectful? Uh, was, did the officer listen to you? That sort of thing. And, uh, but that's a small group. We have to remember, 
and when we get into this later about the, the, the community-wide survey, two out of three people in Portland, and in a lot of cities it's three out of four, uh, don't have a contact with the police in the last year or two. And so they're just listening to the media or whatever. But the ones that actually have contact, you want to listen to them. And it turns out that uh, the Portland Police Bureau is just starting a, w w working with the National Police Foundation in Washington, D.C., is starting, is field testing a new contact survey now using both, uh, I believe, text messaging and telephone interviews. But trying to get at, th there's your base, for those of you in the audience that aren't familiar with what I'm talking about, it's basically customer satisfaction surveys in the public sector. It's uh, how were you treated by an officer that you had contact with in the last couple of weeks. And that's a database that uh, I happen to sit on the National um, uh, Council on uh, Measures for Justice, developing new metrics for criminal justice nationwide. And we're pushing for things like this. We need new metrics. We can't just rely on the, the existing things. So Portland is hopefully on the cutting edge there. <coughs> So I would keep track of that data when it comes in. Well, I think um, I, I'm aware of the survey that's being distributed, but I think there's been negative feedback, especially of communities of color, where officers have gone and distributed the uh, or attempted to have um, folks fill out the survey, um, and, and really the officers are not representative of the community that they're. So there are, are there are practical barriers, um, and some and some things that um, I think the community should be working towards or, or this or this piece up can be working towards to help facilitate um, the, I, the I delivery of the survey. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I d but I think the survey you're talking about is a different survey. That's something that PPB is probably doing as part of its community mm -hmm. engagement work. Uh, this survey is being done independent out by an outside third party. And it would just involve text messages or telephone calls. Wouldn't involve any physical surveys. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to just speak to PSEP's role in all of this um, with the compliance office, um, with the city, and with the community as a whole, um, and kind of responding to your, the end of your comments about the, just what is PSEP's role in this and, and looking at the settlement agreement, but also going beyond that. And I think that PSEP can do both at the same time whenever this when this settlement agreement comes by us and we're looking at the these reports we have a duty to represent the community which is not always here but we interact with as uh, PSEP members in officially in this capacity but also in our other roles most of us are working in environments where we're coming in contact with the city uh, and, and its community members and I think it's essential when, when something like this is presented to us that we as you had mentioned hold people's feet to the fire and I think that um, there, in my opinion, is a large concern about there being substantial compliance um, in regards to everything. And what I want to point out is the difference between uh, um, outcomes and outputs. And the settlement agreement addresses a lot of outputs, a lot of things that they want to see, the trainings, um, the mental health units, the, the, the teams and, the, and those things. But those, are, those aren't the end goals. Those are just what we want to get to in order to get to some outcomes as you were mentioning around procedural justice, people being treated fairly, people not being killed, uh, folks with mental illness being um, uh, properly s serviced. Um, and I, until we know what those um, outcomes are that we want, how are we able, as Marcia and others have pointed out, able to really even assess whether these things are being done? There's a trainings that the, the, the um, PPB has done but is that actually leading to officers using less force or, or, or helping community members or feeling that they're, they're feeling um, better treated? And, and the community members that I've talked to, that's not the case. Uh, with youth communities, with communities of color, um, that's not what I've been hearing. Uh, the, this executive summary mentions if any violations of the agreement are minor or occasional and are not uh, systemic. We, we have the death of Andre Gladden and Lane Martin today or this year, two of the five um, people killed by police this year. Uh, that's 40 percent, and both of them had, uh, were having mental health crises at the times of their death. So how in 
in a year where we were 40% of the people killed by police are having mental health crises, can we still be achieving substantial compliance for a settlement agreement that specifically deals with mental illness? Um, mm -hmm. The and so the question is: Are are Andre Gladden and Lane Martin are those just outliers and just uh, like just outside of what's without what otherwise is good conduct, or are they part of systemic? Uh, problems that still need to be addressed. I 100% uh, agree that PPB has made tremendous strides in the five years that you guys have uh, uh, been working with them, um, but we're, there's still a lot of progress to be made. Um, it says the settlement agreement was designed to reassure the public and the court that changes made in Portland will be sustained. Changes have been made, but I, I, I don't know much of the public that fe feels reassured at this point, and so I believe that, uh, and we'll get into this later, but that substantial compliance is still um, a ways off. Okay, that can I respond to that? Yeah. Okay, you made a lot of good points there. Outcomes versus uh, outputs, um, and I I understand your frustration. There have been important incidents. Uh, I think, uh, but I'm encouraging all of you to read the settlement agreement carefully, and read our reports carefully and DOJ's reports. We are constrained by the settlement agreement. We are. You're not necessarily. But as far as we are focusing largely on changes in their process, changes in their programs, changes in their behavior, changes in their training, changes in their audits. Uh, there isn't a lot of talk of outcomes. There's talk vaguely about <coughs> trust. Uh, there and and they weren't held to certain outcomes, uh, although we have used outcomes periodically. I uh, the c we pushed for a community survey, which they've done every other couple of years and these contact surveys now. And, uh, you know, uh, and so I think that that's, that's one important, uh, the changes themselves, the systems, the, the systems are in place to make change. And I do wanna make another comment, which is that these changes don't happen, the, they don't change a whole culture and a whole organization overnight. These things take years and decades, but they have to be sustained and someone has to keep an eye on them. Um, and regarding these, out, y uh, you know, you talk about we don't know what the outcomes are, but you know there's been these horrible incidents, and they're traumatic incidents, and, and they're catastrophic for families and the community. Uh, and I'm not going to comment on some of those because they're still under investigation, but they, I want to put my academic hat on here for just a second, okay? So, you know, I spent 30 years training PhD students in how to evaluate social programs. How would you know if a program is working or not? Right. And um, we don't, first of all, you need good research measures, but, but more importantly, you don't rely on, in we incidents are what we call air variants. I mean, there's tragic lies, but in a statistician's mind, it's air variants. It's, devi it's random fluctuation. The reality is you have to look for patterns. You have to look for patterns overall. That's why DOJ calls them pattern and practice of excessive force. Uh, we can debate sometimes whether that's really a pattern or not, but that's what I encourage you to look for. Uh, there are going to be these things. That also means on that normal distribution, there's going to be a few cops that still don't get it after all this training. And what are we doing about that? You know, so it's con you know both are important. Um, and you can learn <coughs> things, though, from events. Don't get me wrong. DOJ, is, uh, there's been a bunch of publications in the last five years about sentinel events. What can we learn about a tragedy if we analyze it in detail? What went wrong where? You know, what went wrong with the Boeing Max 3740? You know, if we analyze it in detail, we can figure it out. What went wrong in this particular force case? Things could have been done better. And, and fortunately, what I'm telling you is that PPB now has systems in place where those inspectors analyze the heck out of those force cases and give feedback in addition to legal prosecutorial issues. They give feedback immediately to are there training implications for this? Are there implications for this individual to his supervisor that sh he doesn't do that again? <coughs> whatever he did, you know. So those systems were not in place a few years ago. I mean, they were informally sometimes, but now it's required. So there are things, but you know, you don't change you don't turn an ocean liner around overnight and uh, or and immediately like a speedboat, right? I mean, it takes it's, it takes time. So, but I I don't don't get me wrong. You guys should go wherever you need to go. I'm just saying the settlement agreement, and I don't know if DOJ is here and wants to refer to that. It's <coughs> it's narrowly defined. You 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 talk about uh, 
kids in school, uh, someone in one of their recommendations I noticed uh, being arrested too much, African Americans being arrested. That's not in here. But I'm not saying it's not important. I've seen that problem in nationwide in other schools. Yeah, and I, so I would. That's my. Tom wants to say something. Okay, Tom. <laughs> that's not Tom. That's you. You want to say something? <laughs> okay, go ahead, Tom. Hi, I just wanted to add to this conversation about systems being the outcome um, of implementation. So, in the amended settlement agreement, paragraph 170 talks about how we're gonna how the COCO has to look at whether the implementation of the settlement agreement has created these various systems. There's systems for responding to persons with mental health crisis and accountability. Um, and so what we've done with our, with our uh, quarterly and semi-annual reports is we've looked at not only has the implementation of the letter of the individual paragraphs been, been accomplished, but has it led to those systems um, and so to kind of add on to what Dr. Rosenbaum was saying, uh, with mental health, there's these systems of evaluating the mental health template data. One of the things that uh, the analysts in the BHU did is he identified with BHRT uh, clients after, as they were nearing the 60-day uh, period after receiving BHRT services, they saw a slight blip in police contacts. So what they did is they got ahead of that. Yeah, we they talked about that. that trend. Yeah. Right. And so basically have these has the in implementation of the paragraphs led to systems and that's a large part of where we're also finding substantial compliance is that not only have they checked the box with the individual paragraphs, but they've also created these systems that that act as a as, as a system for self governance and as a system for self improvement. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And I guess the other one thing I would say, and I'll stop talking, is if you guys really want to tell us that you feel there that the city and PPB are not in substantial compliance to us, I would strongly encourage you uh, to not necessarily talk about incidents or people or whatever, but say paragraph so and so they did not do that. You know, what specific paragraph and what in that language didn't they do? Because that's what we're judging them by. It's not checking boxes, but it's legally binding for us. Thank you. I'm going to move on to Amy. Um, yeah, speaking of paragraphs, um, there's two that really catch my attention, and one is paragraph 89 and one is paragraph 90. Both speak to the um, CCOs putting together one or more drop-off centers for first responders and public walk-in centers for individuals with addictions and or behavioral health services, um, which I totally understand. A lot of this wasn't mandated by, um, you know, the settlement agreement, but I do notice that um, there's lots of references in both 89 and 90, which clearly uh, kind of tell me that you're stating there was no opportunity for people to engage, but yet we find everything um, is substantially compliant. The other is um, down below in paragraph 90. It talks about, um, wow, these committees will pursue immediate and long-term improvements to the behavioral health care system. Initial improvements include, I guess in the COCOL summary, increased sharing of information subject to lawful disclosure, but it doesn't say what information, creation of rapid access clinics, I'd sure like to know where they are, enhanced access to primary care providers, that's kind of um, exclusive to who their CCO is and who they're allowed to have as a provider, makes it complicated to get new ones, um, expand options for BOC operators to divert calls to civilian mental health services, um, but it doesn't explain who or what addressing unmet needs identified by Safer PDX, who's Safer PDX and what do they do? Expanding and strengthening networks of peer mediated services. Um, who's providing the peer mediated services and um, I guess how is it um, put out? So, and then it says down below that the officers did not have an ample opportunity to participate in subcommittee efforts 
but it doesn't specify what subcommittees they did not have, um, I guess, access to getting into. Because it talks about having subcommittees form to talk about this, and the BHU would be overseeing a lot of that information, but it doesn't get into descriptives as to who or what was done in order to show that it was substantial compliance for these two paragraphs. So that was just kind of my question is the who, the what, the where, and then you say that even though this can't be done, we've met substantial compliance. So I guess I'm a little confused. Okay, well, um, Tom, you didn't hear that, right? <laughs> no, I, I heard that. Okay, this is your area, but I will just say, yeah, I will, but first I just, I just wanna say that Again, these are real problems. I'm, I don't deny that they are, and I don't think Tom will either, some of these. We can probably be more specific, but uh, it's an issue of, uh, in the end, who's responsible for this? And so who, 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 who's responsible for making these changes? So Tom, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, and I, I think one of, I, I understand your, your concern with uh, with everything not being detailed out in this, I think that this is a function of this having been found in substantial compliance in a prior report, um, and this was just the updated on that on that prior substantial compliance. Um, so our our summary of paragraph 90, you're right that it doesn't give the details. So I'm looking at the full the full amended settlement agreement, um, and so the increased sharing of information that part. That's between BOAC, Multnomah County, and healthcare providers. Um, a lot of that is done with the BHCT. Again, and the, the crux of paragraph 90 is that the CCOs will immediately create uh, these subcommittees. Um, and so again, we look to see what PPB and the city can reasonably be expected to do in order to satisfy the intent of, of these paragraphs. So. Through PPB um, and through the BHU and the BHU uh, coordinating uh, team, there is increased sharing of information that's subject to lawful disclosure. Um, the uh, the one part that you talked about where it was uh, connecting, at BOAC having the opportunity to connect to peer provider to, to to civilian providers. Uh, BOAC partners with the Multnomah, Crisis, uh, Multnomah County Crisis Line uh, when the call doesn't require a police response immediately. And the MCCCL, uh, they, work with, uh, they work with one of the CCOs. I forget it off the top of my head right now. Um, but there is that coordination. Some of these, you're right, they haven't come to fruition. Uh, the paragraph 90G, the telepsychiatry where you can do video conferencing, that's something that has not come out of the settlement agreement. Um, but again, it's the, the question is, are the CCOs supposed to do it, which is what paragraph 90 says, and the CCOs aren't under the settlement agreement. So we look at what PPB has done, what the city has done, what BOEC has done, um, and that's where maybe not in this report and that's why i'm saying i apologize that most of this detailed information that i think you're asking for would have come when we had first found them in substantial compliance for paragraph 90. um but the city and the city's entities have done a lot of things to at least try to accommodate the, the intent of paragraph 90. Um, and that's where we find substantial compliance is is in their efforts to, to do what they can within their power. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, so thank you for the presentation. Um, so I heard you say two things. One, the theory is that all of this training will produce better results. And then you also said that over the five years you've seen those better results. So as an academic as well, I like to look at the data and I appreciate you saying two incidents is, you know, is hard to make a general conclusion from, but the Portland Police Bureau has collected data on use of force incidents, and their data for the last two years suggests that 50% of the use of force incidents are against houseless people, 27% are 
black people in a city that is 6% black. About 14% are people in a mental health crisis. So I, I would put the question to you, um, does that suggest if all of this training has happened that the, these are successful statistics um, as a result of that training? These statistics seem egregious and suggest that either the training <coughs> is, is not working and or the settlement agreement will provide nothing in terms of outcome change. And I appreciate you saying you're, you're beholden to what the actual paragraphs of the legal documents say. But say, for instance, there were a thousand people with mental illness killed by the police mm -hmm. um, every year, or that 98% of the use of force incidents were houseless people. I think those outcomes have to mean something in terms of the output in terms of the trainings suggesting that these trainings aren't actually being effective. And a second question I have to you, in the 2018 auditor's report on the Gang Enforcement Task Force, they noted that in 90% of the traffic stops, there was no data collected on the reasons for those stops. And they criticized the Bureau for that. The Bureau acknowledged that. Is that data being collected? And if so, is it publicly available or can PSAP um, be given that data? Okay. On the last question, by the way, I, I would su suggest you, uh, the auditor has done the latest analysis of that. I think the data are available and I think they are doing a better job, but I, I can't speak for that because I haven't specifically <laughs> investigated that. Uh, but back to your original, the theory is not just that training will lead to better results. Uh, it's actually the, the DOJ model is more of a p policy change leads to training leads to better results. So in fact, a big part of the settlement consent settlement agreement is that they have to change their policies in all these areas. And we spent like a couple of years arguing about the wording of policy. And then that was the basis for training. But then the other thing that the, I just want to clarify the theory. My primary theory here in Tom's is, is that it's not the training, it's the measurement of the organization as a learning organization. So uh, if you don't measure something, it doesn't matter. Nobody can care. You can lie about how good you're doing, et cetera, if you don't keep measure. So I agree with you, the data. But so setting up all these internal systems of review and auditing and checking on themselves, as well as an external system of checking as the public who had a recent contact satisfied with the encounter. And I think that will tell you guys a lot if they keep doing that over the next few years. Uh, that's really critical. Uh, regarding use of force, I mean, the glass half full, half empty, <coughs> I mean, it's a very, the, the houseless thing. Here's a, another example. Do I, I think it's a tragedy in this country what's going on with homeless and houseless people. It's like, but, but two quick comments. Uh, one is we got to think bigger than the police, okay. But secondly, with regard to police, show me in this consent decree, this settlement agreement, where that word is even mentioned. It's not. It's not in here. So I'm not saying you shouldn't take it up. I think you should. Uh, so I'm just saying different roles here is all I'm saying. Okay, could I just ask yeah. you then, given this data, do you think the training is, there was the, the point about training about neutrality in this um, procedural justice. Right. Neutrality means not targeting particular groups. Right. Do you think that this data suggests that the police are not targeting particular groups? Um, well, the houseless data is, is particularly complicated, I've learned. And someone from the police here may want to talk about that. A lot of those um, uh, use of forces are, uh, there's, there's arrests over warrants and all kinds of things that make it unusual, but is that, uh, that's that's an issue uh, in terms of bias, which is what you're talking about. Excuse me, I should talk in the microphone. Uh, in terms of bias, this is a bigger, m too much bigger issue for than for tonight. We can't. Researchers generally talk about disparities, okay, first because it's hard to determine. Bias involves motive and knowing exactly what, but why there are disparities, and so. Differences by race and by gen, by age, by all kinds of things. Young black males and young Hispanic males are 
stopped and used force a lot more than not just everywhere in the country but the, you need the right baseline so you need the right denominator to, to determine you know and we talked about this in one of our reports I kind of gave the city credit for uh, in the bureau for looking at for example traffic stops looking at what the rate of traffic accidents were in that neighborhood as a good benchmark and denominator um, and uh, you know so we don't have this figured out yet nationally there's a lot of people talking about what's the appropriate benchmarks to determine whether there's really race bias and I encourage you guys to look into that I've got to give you some references but uh, so I, I'm uncomfortable answering that right away I did say in my report that that looks like you know when you adjust for some of these things it's the problem isn't as bad as I thought it was I did not want to get in to evaluate the gang unit that was a whole nother issue and the, and the auditor has taken that on so uh, but anyway yeah I don't you're raising some good points here and uh, but I think that uh, the, my last comment to you would be uh, Again, the, out, the outcomes were not a main focus of the consent settlement agreement. Uh, the process was, but we did look at some outcomes. But it's also when you say, it, you know, it doesn't seem to be having any effect at all, it's, it's almost too soon, I would argue. Uh, if, if these I would agree, it's too soon. Yeah, too soon to expect the outcomes, which aren't in the settlement agreement. Yeah, and <laughs> too soon to say it's substantially compliant because yeah. of that. Yeah. Right. Anyway. Okay. okay. Um, Tom wants to say something. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. Sure. I what I wanted to do is also in the in the conversation about the house population. Um, I, I also wanted to bring that back into the fold of systems and PCB's ability to identify trends and implement uh, an improvement process. So one of the things that they did that we reported on this report is that they now have five BHRT teams. One of those teams is solely dedicated to the houseless population. So when you see uh, a large amount of, of interactions between police and houseless um, and the houseless population, one of the things that they did is that they're now sending out the BHRT uh, teams to see if they can uh, to, to provide services or to coordinate with services, not provide services, but to have services coordination. Um, and so one of the things that we've measured is, is BHRT effective? And one of the things that we've seen is that, yes, prior to BHRT intervention, you had a significantly higher number of police interactions than after BHRT uh, intervention. So the fact that PPB can now identify those trends and dispatch a team dedicated solely to the houseless population in an attempt to to reduce those interactions, that again brings us back to have they implemented systems to resolve issues on their own? And there's one of the examples of them being able to do that. Um, and so I okay. just wanted to bring that conversation back into the systems aspect of it. Okay, thanks, Tom. Thank you, Elliot, and thank you both for responding. Uh, Britt? You and Elliot actually covered most of what I wanted to talk about. This might be a stupid question. I wasn't here for the presentation, but in, in terms of the, the training, I was reading about the scenario training that's been implemented recently. And in terms of the debrief, because I was interested to read that a lot of officers were struggling with the training at first. In terms of the debrief, is it mostly just the instructors talking to or sharing their own um, takeaways with officers, or is there actually a way to have officers reflect themselves and like actively rework through some of these things so that they are able to make improvements and not just move on after hearing a lecture that they don't really listen to. If that makes any sense. Yeah, no, that that's good. First of all, it isn't a lecture. They're actually engaging with a person uh, in an encounter, uh, an actor, and they don't know what this actor is going to do. Uh, uh, yeah, I meant for the, the debrief yeah. afterwards, yeah. after so the then scenario. Then there's a debrief, but you're, you're absolutely raising some good points. So the debrief was pretty sophisticated. Uh, it did ask them to talk about what they did and why they did it and to think through their actions. And then they more and more engaged them. And then they ask them what, how that tied into procedural justice and some of the concepts. And, and then they, uh, they gave them actual feedback on their performance. They got it rated and evaluated on like a three-point scale. And so uh, there was a system created to give feedback to each officer after immediately after 
the encounter. And, and you could fail if you really did horrible. I don't know that anybody did, but they did vary. There was variation in their scores, and it correlated highly with my own observations. So I thought they did a pretty good job. Okay. Thank you. Great question, Britt. Patrick? <coughs> yeah, um, you're absolutely correct. Uh, homelessness is not mentioned in, in this uh, at all. But what is mentioned is mental illness. And I would like to, to um, can you guess which two, organ, which two groups of people are least likely to report with, oh. when, they, when you ask them to report? Uh, people of color. And people of color. And, and people with mental illnesses, right? Yeah. Which are the, you know. To report uh, what? That they've, had a, that they've had a negative incident with the police. Oh, out of fear. Yeah. Um, and then, and then uh, secondly, um, I am somebody who lives in East County, and I feel it's really important to, to pay attention to such things. Um, where I live in East Portland, I should say, not East County. Um, I am somebody who is on the PCEP. I probably would expect a invite of some sort, and I can honestly say that I'm not aware of when the annual report was to my to my precinct. So maybe they're just not effective at getting it out or maybe there was causality some there, somewhere there. I do want to say thank you for recognizing that you're passing the baton and that, and that you are uh, recognized that substantial compliance is not a means to, is not the be all end all of a rec, uh, uh, and it does recognize that there is room for improvement. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate those comments, and I'll just say that I, do, I totally agree with you that they might be less likely to report on a survey. Hopefully they would because the surveys are uh, anonymous and people are told that. They may not trust that. But uh, And I also hope the complaint system, I can't remember here, I think it's moderately good with uh, IPR, but you also don't want people to be afraid to, to complain. <coughs> I, I agree totally, but yeah. for instance, there are times in my life when um, I would not feel comfortable reporting an incident that the police had had yeah. had, had with me. And that has to do uh, with trust. Can you speak in the microphone, please? Dr. Rosenbaum. Oh, sorry. That has to do with trust or? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're going to swing it back down to this end of the table. I just want to let everybody know we're going to take a break after all the PSIP members give a comment just because there's been such a long section here. Um, and then we'll come back to public comment. Um, we have Sam down there, and then we'll go back this way. Um, yeah, the only thing I would add is um, I don't have a problem with the finding of substantial compliance. Um, when looking at the um, document and what it says and what's required, uh, I think all the things that are that are, are coming up are important issues, and I don't... Um, minimize any of them but I think those are issues for us to take up as uh, uh, for PSEP to take up moving forward the substantial compliance is not again it's been said not the be all to end all and I think when Mayor Wheeler created the PSEP his thought and his hope is that it would outlast the DOJ and um, uh, the settlement agreement and that we would still be working together with the community and the police to make sure that these issues are addressed and and that the police continue to do um, the work that the Department of Justice Settlement Agreement says and the community expects. I see this as um, we're not at the finish line, but like we're coming out of the blocks. It's the start. It's it's the beginning of uh, change. And I th and I do think over the last five years there's been a lot of improvement from the Portland Police and. Uh, the community and engagement and we're in a different place than we were that doesn't mean we're where we want to be by any means when people are still being shot and killed and profiling we still have a lot of issues to deal with um, but i don't have a problem with um, substantial compliance thank you for that perspective sam steve so my question is you you've actually studied other cities who have gone through similar types of reviews from the justice department and so forth uh, and it's interesting to me that there's a lot of uh, every police, every incident of the police showing up and dealing with these things starts with a, somebody called or, you know, usually somebody called. So that goes to BOAC. 
And it, it's interesting that the review of BOAC procedures are done just by the, the, the behavioral health unit uh, and the behavioral health unit assistant chief. And I'm not familiar if that department, who carries a heavy weight, has any kind of other advisory committees that, that oversee their procedures and and the metrics that they're uh, you know that that are needed to ensure that the police officers have all the right information that uh, you know the these these procedures continue to follow. I just don't know how in the future they will be held accountable. That's the question I have. Yeah, I, well, there is a BHU advisory council, uh, a committee, and uh, that oversees, and that has a number of entities on it, not just. Uh, police related um, and that's an oversight committee I don't know if you think you're aware of that or yeah I, I, I'm aware of that my my thing is BOAC oh, it's BOAC. the actual communication yeah. folks gotcha. like um, I mean I know there's a ton of advisory committees for for the Portland police yes are there any over them to see, ensure that they're doing best practices not to my knowledge does you want to answer that yeah come on up. Good evening, I'm, uh, Turn I'm Bob Causey, uh, director of BOEC. And um, you know, when you ask about the accountability, I think you're looking at mm -hmm. in terms of um, you know, making sure that our dispatchers and call takers are following the procedures, we have a user board that oversees our operations. They help us establish policy. Uh, we also have, um, uh, not as robust as I'd like it to be, uh, but we're in the process of developing our quality assurance program. And that is starting with um, medical and fire call taking triage. We're uh, just now implementing a new program. Uh, in fact, our kickoff is uh, next Monday uh, to integrate uh, medical and fire triage uh, within our call taking and uh, integrate it in the computer system. Uh, police calls for service are a little bit different. We're not going to be integrating that right away. Uh, but our hope is that within a year, we're going to have an established quality assurance program specifically tied to medical calls and fire calls. Um, after that, it's, it's probably another year beyond that time frame to be able to implement the police call taking protocol that's integrated within the system. Uh, with those protocols integrated, we're able to do uh, set quality assurance that is uh, prescribed, I don't remember the percentage off the top of my head, uh, prescribed number of calls that we review. Uh, but in the meantime, we are reviewing calls that are assigned to uh, BHU and those, those types of mental health triage calls. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, could you state your name one more time for us? Yeah, Bob Causey. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna finish off with Lakeisha. I think I think a lot has been said. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, we are going to take a five-minute break. We'll be starting back at seven twenty-five, um, and we'll get going on that. Thank you.
part of the meeting. It's our members back in and Sam. We're about to. Okay. We're gonna give Sam a chance to get back in here. Huh? Yeah, we're gonna start to Okay, so how we're gonna conduct the second half of this um uh public comment section is we are going to just hear from community members. We're not gonna have Dr. Rosenbaum respond just in the interest of time. Um, what we will do is allow Dr. Rosenbaum to type up any notes or bless you, um, or any kind of responses that we'll provide publicly. Um, we're gonna have a 15 minute period for this and we will end it at uh, 7.45. We have two microphones. If you just wanna line up and then um, state your name, any organization you're with, and then give your comments. Um, keep your comments related to this. If your comment is not about the settlement agreement, we're just gonna cut it off, or the COCO report, excuse me. Um, yeah, so we're gonna open it up right here. Hi, I'm, I'm Mike Schumann. I'm with Portland Capwatch. Hang on and one I just second, hang on one second. Where's Dr. Rosen? I, I want, he's gotta have to be here for, the, for any <laughs> comments, so okay. give us a second. We're Dr. Rosenbaum. Could you tell me who's ready? Yeah. Is it a name or I'm just I'm sure he's Oh, okay, there he, he is. He went home. Just give us half a second for him to get settled. Sure. No, you're all right. So just so you know, um, just to reiterate, we're having 15 minute comment process. We're um, gonna ask that Dr. Rosenbaum that you not respond just in the interest of time so we can get as many community members through. And then um, any notes or feedback you wanna give, you can uh, type those up and then we can put them up on the Peace Up website for folks to respond to that. And um, we'll make sure to record names too, just for that purpose. So if you could say your name, any organization. My name's Mike Schumann, I'm with Portland Capwatch. And I just wanna give a little perspective to this whole thing. Six, seven, eight, five years ago, and continuing, the city has a, had a problem with the Portland Police Department. They were being using excessive force, a lot of it on mentally ill people. And this, the, it was so bad that the federal government came in and they sued the city to try and get it straightened out. And the city, in its wisdom, hired the esteemed Dr. Rosenbaum to come in and see if we can correct the problem. And this is a quote for today, outcomes are not the main focus of the settlement agreement. What are you doing here if outcomes are not the main focus of the settlement agreement? Outcomes are what we wanted you to do, to change things so that it doesn't keep happening. And my second and only other comment is, in the last two years, I don't think any police officers in the last several years were disciplined for excessive force. And so there's a whole component of this thing which says that if, if, if a police officer is continually or start using force that they shouldn't be using, that somebody disciplines them. The main problem in Portland is it doesn't happen. It's like the elephant in the room. And those are the only two things I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Uh, hi, I'm Dan Handelman. I'm also with the Portland Cop Watch. And I could spend 15 minutes talking about this, but I'll do as quickly as I can the comments that I do have. I appreciated that um, the question was raised about why do we still have people with mental illness dying at the hands of the police. And this is not just a statistical aberration. If you look with a larger pool of data, if you go back in time, if you look at what the OIR group published, when they were looking at stuff before the DOJ came, 55% of the people who were killed had mental health issues. Afterwards, 65% of people did. So in the last two years, I would say there were three people this year who had mental health crisis. Um, in the last two years, uh, that number is 54%. So we're back to where we were before, but it's not improving. Um, so just looking at this as one or two incidents a year isn't doing a statistical scientific analysis, which is what we're expecting from the compliance officer. Um, yeah, and uh, on that note, um, I believe that Dr. Rosenbaum said that there was no force used other than minor kinds of force against uh, people with mental health issues, with mental health issues, but we, at least two or three people who died this year uh, had mental health issues. So those statistics exclude deadly force. Um, 
So we uh, are going to put out a longer statement. We've already talked a little bit um, to folks, including the media, about concerns about the findings. I gr I'm very glad that um, PCCP is thinking about asking them. Findings not to be complete. Uh, the uh, IPR reaching a 94% uh, goal, uh, or, or when the when the goal is 100% of uh, investigations in 180 days, that's clearly not in compliance. Um, and there was no analysis of the fact that the reason that these both internal affairs and the IPR have been able to speed up their investigations is that they've gotten rid of half their investigations by giving them to supervisors and calling it supervisory investigations. And the, the COCL hasn't had time, because these only started a few months ago, to do an analysis of whether those are being appropriately categorized and whether it's more serious cases that used to be investigated are now being shuffled off to these supervisors. So of course it's easier to get your job done when your caseload is cut in half. Um, the BHU uh, Advisory Count Committee, which was mentioned, still doesn't hold open meetings. Yes, the settlement agreement doesn't technically say they have to have open meetings, but what we're talking about in terms of compliance and outcomes is the spirit of this agreement, not the letter of the agreement. And that is what is, I think we're wrestling with between what you're saying and what we're saying. Right? The spirit is those meetings should have been open from day one, and they've never had an open public meeting of the BHUAC. They had one kind of public event, but it wasn't a meeting. And the um, Mental Health Association asked them in March one more time to open meetings, and they waited till after your report came out that said, oh, they don't have to do it, we just suggest that they do it, and finally answered the Mental Health Association and said, um, we're not gonna do it. So you green-lighted a continuation of something that goes against the idea of community engagement. <clears throat> uh, and the peep, I don't know if anybody's waiting to talk. Um, the PPB's annual reports were presented with, the first one was presented with no advance notice that we know of. The, East, the one in East County, or in East Precinct, was done with one day's notice, and the one at City Council happened uh, eight days after it was announced here at this meeting, which didn't give us time to turn people out. There were only five of us, including me, uh, who testified at that meeting. If the, if the Bureau was engaged in, in, with the community and interested in community engagement, they would have publicized it, turned people out, and actually asked City Council to hold an evening meeting so people who worked during the day could have made it. So this is just kind of a, the tip of the iceberg of some of the things I wanted to say. Um, and if there's extra time, I'd like to... Yeah, maybe we'll have you come back up, but I want to make sure that we open it up to other folks. Thank you, Dan. Hi, um, I'm Jan Friedman. I'm here with Disability Rights Oregon. And I just want to make the point that I think that this has been a long process, of course. Uh, so many people have been in on this long process. I think at this point, uh, trying to wrap it up too fast and trying to say, oh, it's done because there's that output. Look, look, they've done this and they've done that, but we don't care about outcomes. Um, or outcomes aren't really the point. Let's look at the paper. But you know, the PSAP has a difficult job. They're doing community engagement. Uh, the community's not looking at specific paragraphs of the settlement agreement. As you know, this was a, a issue of unconstitutional use of force back in 2012, settlement agreement in 2014. PSEP has only had one year to convene and work on community engagement. I think they're doing a great job um, doing their work, but this is not enough time to engender trust. We don't have trust. Uh, you know, we don't have full engagement, not for lack of trying, but because it's only been really in the last year and quite recently that we have a community engagement plan even. So let's put it in place, let's see how it works, and let's afterwards have that extra year. Because if we're just you know, waltzing off now, I, it's just not right. It's, it seems like a rush to the finish line and it's not the kind of thing we can rush on. That's not fair to our citizens. Thank you, Jan. Uh, Alexa Simpson, I'm actually um, an unhoused community member. Um, there's a couple things that I wanted to touch on. Um, if these community surveys are being 
required to be sent out or initiated based off of a phone call or a text, that data is gonna be skewed and erroneous because if over 50% of the encounters are with the unhoused community, you know, those should be sent out via mail. Um, any other official public notice has to be published in the newspaper. Um, for those that have a lack of telephony-based services or the choice to lack telephony-based services. So that data is, is not going to be representing what's truly happening and these encounters are not going to be tr you know, documented and, and these, these surveys aren't representing what's really happening out there. Um, additionally, a major concern that I have is the lack of a cycle or rotation uh, in regards to the officer patrol, uh, patrol districts or regions that they patrol to, pre uh, to prevent the development of personal relationships with the unhoused community. I have personally witnessed and been a victim of discriminatory, biased, and predatory behavior. Uh, and this is especially true during the conducted sweeps. Um, and I was informed by an active patrol officer on duty during a sweep that the officers conducting or helping facilitate the sweeps are not shown as active or available officers on duty. Um, and that data is not even shown to their colleagues or other officers in the field. Um, so that leads me to believe they're operating without proper surveillance. That's a huge oversight. Um, it, this is something that remains unmentioned in any documentation that I see in regards to the police conduct in our city. And some of the things that I have personally gone through and witnessed are foul. Um, especially very, very predatory behavior, especially with warrant sweeps. Um, people are exposed, they're having to move their belongings. Um, a lot of the information that's presented to the public um, in regards to the process um, when it comes to these sweeps is incorrect. If you call this one point of contact system line, it indicates we have advocates at street level who provide us with services um, or information on how to access said services, which are either lacking or non-existent. Um, they state that they give us a specific time frame and date for you know um, the sweeps to be conducted. That's not true. We're given about seven to ten days, two one, two days in some areas. Um, there's no transparency um, in regards to what's considered of value or of necessity, and we're having private patrol companies determine what's of value or necessity and take our belongings then to these. Um, storage facilities that you know are difficult to contact or require that there's police interaction to obtain your belongings. Um, and I, I feel and that's actually intentional because a lot of the in-house community has had a poor interaction with an officer. They feel scared um, you know, or, or put in a position where um, they're re-traumatized and then their belongings, their belongings are not um, retrieved and they're put back in a position again where they're displaced further. The divide is just growing when it comes to having respect or a desire to work with the city or the city officials and people feel hurt, damaged, traumatized, and lost. And if you want to see growth and you want to see people being active in their community, there needs to be respect. And I feel that there's none. Um, that's all that I have to say at this point in time. Thank you. Could you say your name one more time, please? Uh, yes, Alexis Simpson. Thank you for sharing your lived experience. I'm going to go to um, Philip. <clears throat> Hi, this is Philip Wolf speaking. I'm a community member here, living in ten, 10 years here in the city of Portland. Several things I'd like to discuss tonight um, <clears throat> are one is a question about an evaluation. Um, that's occurring when the police officer has has considered um, a community member a concern or a mental illness um, st status. So I don't feel comfortable with police making that decision. I feel like a mental health pr uh, professional should be making that decision to uh, take somebody to maybe a drop-off center because when a police officer in uh, uniform with police vehicles uh, taking people off the street anywhere um, will create more of a crisis. Also, in, in this area, many of the home houseless people have been um, taken in, and if you recall, our Mayor Ted Wheeler for the city of Portland had established an um, anti-homeless anti laws, which 
actually it, it actually means that private business owners, private homeowners can just see people on the street and call the police for no reason, no no broken law other than the fact that they're houseless. So that is a systemic problem that needs to be addressed. The tents and the street sweeping has um, been allowed to escalate more crisis situations. There must be a resolution to this problem. The laws that are being set now are reinforcing the problem. And so this is a situation that's just going to be increasing in severity. Um, with all due respect, I do understand how the settlement agreement is worded and what exactly needs to be changed with it. And it does need to be complied with. Now, I just encourage the PSEP members to f do more than what what is defined in the settlement agreement. You have this opportunity to take advantage of your position because I feel like these, the PSEP members are really naive to think that police reform is the solution. That's not the outcome. The police reform is not only the problem, it's a systemic issue. It could be that from um, the youth, detention centers, they're a pipeline to prisons, the gang um, enforcement t task force, they are gangs members <laughs> themselves. They're part of their own kind of gang. They can, they have the authority now to profile people of color and other um, other areas. They there's <laughs> there's pro for profit prisons. The unions are protecting the police. If there is a lethal force, um, they the police are able to get immediate representation and they are supported in every facet of their employment and now we've had this discussion for 40 years and there has been no change and there we won't see any changes unless the system has been dismantled or rebuilt right we're going to um, cut it right there so it's, we can get it's a consideration that we pardon uh, that we consider ho uh, the violence you know we're talking we're not talking about police behavior and police violence. There are violent police officers that we can discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. These are our last two folks that will present. Hello, so uh, my name is David Denos and I'm a rogue Canadian who found his way here by accident at the hands of Philip. Uh, so I wanted to uh, commend Dennis over here for presenting the data in a way that's very favorable to the Portland Police Bureau. Um, I want to direct everybody's attention to this kind of biased framing of the data, specifically at the percentage of lower rates of force and the comparing specifically to U.S. localities. The percentage of lower rates of force, his quotes, is patterns and not outcomes. And that's a very academic way of looking at things. And that's also a very problematic way of looking at things. I'm also an academic. I've been, I've been studying years at the University of British Columbia on the, the implementation and the history historical and contemporary laws around colonization and ongoing genocide, specifically in Canada, but also in the US. And academia plays an a huge role in the furthering and the implementation of genocide, specifically in the acceptance by using and manipulating statistics and policy, uh, specific statistics and numbers to present itself in a favor favorable way to the institutions that ex execute that, those genocidal policies. So effectively what's happening is what, everything that I've seen here from a glance is it's really great at putting administrative tasks with no real structural reform. And the two really big areas of genocide is bureaucracy and academia. Academia for the acceptance and the bureaucracy for ensuring that there's difficulties for the people who are struggling with the system to be able to get through it. And so we're seeing, structural, we're seeing no structural reform. Things like adding trainings is not a structural reform. It is the using of, favorable looking policies in a way that enhances the structures to continue exacting its, its devastating violence on communities. And so we, we're, we're ignoring that structural violence through the use, like what, what's being discussed is ignoring totally the use of violence through the use of power. And power is not force. Power is everything from clothing, to training, to tools and weapons, to the language that's used, to where police officers stand, they walk, how they engage with community members. All of that is power, and we haven't even touched on that. And so the role of policing within community engagement 
there's the, the issue there. Structural reform would not look at trainings within that. It would look at changing what the action of policing looks like. Within communities themselves, police officers are not meant to be police officers. They're meant to be members of a community that help them maintain and support and protect that community. So separating that, that is a way that academics further and promote the use of genocide and violence against communities. And I'm using the term genocide very clearly here because the US refuses to use that term and it's ridiculous. There are thousands, and I'm not mincing words, thousands of active genocides going on right now. So my recommend, and, and comparing to US cities specifically, we can't just look at US cities. US is a, I, per, pardon my words here, a shit stain on the world in terms of police violence. The US is not something to compare it to. Looking at US cities and saying Portland is the best model, it's saying it's the best model of number something like 200 in the world in terms of police violence. It's ridiculous. Why are we not looking at other countries around the world? Why are we not looking specifically at communities that do not use policing models? And engaging with them and understanding how communities work without the use of policing models because they exist all over the world, in every country in the world, in communities everywhere. So my recommendation to you, Dennis specifically, is to please, please, please evaluate your data so that they are presented and they think outside of the Americentric bubble. You think outside of that American bubble that makes it look like violence is what we need and makes it look like policing is a standard use of, of community engagement. And for everyone, I would urge everyone to be keen, please be keen on seeing where that structural, violent, violent, uh, structural bias is in the data that is presented because the data that has been used here was, was manipulated and was used to advance specifically the narrative of ensuring the continued support and the continued foundational existence of police here, which is ridiculous. So please, please, please reevaluate your data. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it's David Danos from Canada. <laughs> Thank you, David from Canada. <laughs> Last but not least. Hello, Vanessa Perone, Alexa's mom. There's a lot of passion and compassion there. Thank you for what you've said. Um, first off, <clears throat> from my understanding, you're supposed to be a peace officer. That is not what I see. Uh, I see a lot of, this is just my, because I am houseless, I am on the streets, and Alexa and I have seen and dealt with a lot. So um, there are a lot of crooked cops, and there's a lot of gang members that run the streets, and there's a lot of mentally ill that roam them. Sad. Um, these sweeps, bad, 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 bad. It is causing more stealing and more violence than anything. Um, we've been trying to attend a lot of meetings to gain a lot of insight from all of you, and I'm sure there's a lot of compassionate people here, and that's why we're here. We want change, we want better. And uh, it starts with an area. Let's give these, give us space that is safe so that we don't have to have so many mentally ill just roaming around that they can get help and then the ones that actually want to get off the streets don't have to worry about their shit getting stolen, police coming by and harassing. The same police, like my daughter said, that's the problem is you have the same police officers, peace officers, they're in the same areas. They are building relationships with a lot of the wrong people and allowing a lot of the wrong doings. So, <clears throat> The surveys, never seen it. I don't know why they're not in community buildings. You know, why aren't they at TPI, CCC, library? You know, all the places that these mentally ill and houseless people are. I've never seen them, never heard about it. We need to have street advocates, peers like us, good people that are out here, actually ones to help engage because we've, we've, we know these people you know, so they're more comfortable to come up to us and, and maybe we can help them move forward easier. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. You one Very quickly, yep. Okay. I won't be as long as some folks, but I'll take more than a minute. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm gonna read this, this is a little hard. Yep. Um, use the microphone, please. Yep, oh, sorry. And, and I'll say my name in just yeah. a second. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I'd like to thank the PSEP for welcoming the community, um, and thank Dr. Rosenbaum for his presentation and feedback. Oh, just speak in the microphone, please. Yeah. I'm having a little hard time hearing. My name is Sarah Carlson. I'm a community member of the Portland Police Bureau Training Advisory Council, or TAC, since January. So I'm a new member. 
Um, I'm grateful for the opportunities I've had to attend trainings and the willingness of the officers to meet with me so I can learn more. And I hope over time to share my insight with them. Um, I'm also a community member who struggled with mental health challenges. I had a mental health crisis in 1986, just before my 15th birthday. Um, I was a runaway. The police did find me after about a week. Um, I spent 60 days in a psychiatric hospital being treated for depression. Um, I've had some challenges as an adult, um, and I've also been impacted as a family member. And I share this because I, I imagine I might have an opportunity to connect with some of you. Um, I'm finally in a position where I'm comfortable to start sharing my story in the hope that I might help others, and it's taken me 35 years to be ready to do that. Um, at the time that I was in my crisis, my father was a Navy captain. He was commanding a destroyer, um, and he was at sea. Uh, they actually wanted to send me to long term, but we were moving. So I got out, and the next day we moved. And although I was in treatment for years, we never spoke of it again. So, you know, so I, I hope that I, by sharing my story as an adult, um, who doesn't have to worry about my job or a security clearance or a lot of other things, I can maybe help, I can help some teenager who's struggling or, you know, I, I, I had, a, I had, we had good insurance. My family, although I didn't believe that they loved me, they fought for me and not everybody has those advantages. So I just share that because somebody here might need to hear that. But I do have questions about the agreement for Dr. Rosenbaum. Um, do you, for your, your write-up, do you have some best practices or insight to share for organizations that have been successful following the end of a settlement? And then also, what ha if you see organizations that haven't been successful, and this might not be the right term, I apologize for that, what are they doing or not doing? Because that might be something that, that we as community members or members of the, the training advisory council or, or this organization can also use for our learnings to inform going forward. Um, we're not going to have Dr. Rosenbaum respond just because. No, 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 he's going to write it. Yeah, yep, yeah perfect. But okay. Yeah, I just wanted to ask my Okay, yep, thank Okay, you. thank you. Is there any other questions? I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 but I wanted to share a little bit about me and why I, I do this because I, I think that's important. Thank too. you for sharing. Yeah. And what was your name again? Sarah Carlson. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate all the um, testimony and feedback from the community members. That was um, really impactful. If I could just have our co-chairs of our subcommittees just raise your hands real quick, just so folks, if they want to get involved in some of these subcommittees, I would really encourage you to talk to them after the meeting, and we could really use your input in figuring out how to reach more of those uh, individuals that you uh, talked about. So thank you for that. Um, we are going to Lucky move. Ed. Yes, sir. Can I say something real quick? Yep. Um, Alexis, Alexis, mom, um, I want to thank you for sharing what you shared. Um, I worked as a park ranger for six years, and I was out there, and I saw the, sw the sweeps and some of the stuff that took place. I agree with you that I don't know what the practice is now. The sweeps are not, they're not humane. They're not uh, a good way to engage and treat people that are living on the streets. Taking your property, I, I know the system that you talk about, and putting it in a warehouse or a, a place that you, you know, struggle to even get to, let alone f get your property, and have people determine what is or what isn't valuable to you, is real to you, and uh, it, it's your stuff. So I, I don't want that to be lost on everyone here, whatever you know, when as we move forward, uh, because not only us but the city has to do better at address addressing how we treat homelessness and how we treat people that are houseless in our community especially when we're engaging with them whether it's the police or anybody else and taking their property I've witnessed it and I want to thank you for sharing your story and making it personal so that, that people here can understand and if you didn't it's real and I don't know if they still have that set up where you have to go to the warehouse or the, tr the whatever the heck that thing is. I think I've, I've said from day one, it's not a good system. So I want, I want to acknowledge that I hear you and I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you, Sam. 
Um, we're going to move into our final piece of uh, the meeting, which is our recommendation process. We have four recommendations. Elliot's going to present one on a amendment, a bylaw amendment change on the voting process. I'm going to present one on the uh, recommendation to define out, uh, uh, not define, oh uh, yeah, to define outcomes for substantial compliance. And then we have uh, two recommendations from the subcommittee on the people with mental illness. I think what we're going to do is this, in the interest <laughs> of time, is to have each author read their recommendation, discuss any comments from PSIP on all four of those in a row, and then have public comment at the end on any four of those recommendations just so we don't go through a process of present, comment, vote, and all of that. Does that sound fair? Okay, so I'm going to open it up to Elliot, um, but I will say this also, unless there's any disagreement from PSIP members, that we will stay past 8.30 to make sure these get finished, um, because a lot of hard work was done, and this meeting has been um, very helpful. So if you do have to leave, you can um, let me know, of, uh, if we don't get to all the votes yet, what you would be voting on these. And with that, I'll turn it over to Elliot. Thanks. Okay, Anna. So this is a very technical and I think hopefully simple change to the bylaws. It's responding to an issue which came up at the August meeting where we had eight members on the board, six voted in favor of something, two abstained, and it didn't pass because the bylaws as they exist now said you need seven members out of 13 and there were only eight members there and that caused a lot of um, concern amongst community members who felt like the the wishes of the board at least the present members was not being was not being expressed through the vote and so this amendment asked to change section 4 F on voting it currently says the majority of seats per ORS 174.130 um, will be how is voted and I simply want to change that to be the majority of members present at the meeting. The Oregon statute that's cited there simply states that voting in Oregon will be done by a majority, but I consulted Eliza Kaplan at Lewis and Clark Law School and she assures me that the quorum, the way the legislature in Oregon works is you have a, establish a quorum, which is also in our bylaws. Once you have the quorum, which in our case would be seven members, then after that is when the ma you could have a majority vote. So it simply would allow us to pass measures um, uh, without a, a cumbersome process because we've had many meetings, um, unlike this one, where uh, many of our members have not been present. Thank you. Um, this recommendation is called the recommendation to define outcomes for substantial compliance. It follows uh, the public testimony, which was overwhelming that they feel um, uh, substantial compliance is premature and it's in almost impossible to define what success looks like without outcomes. Um, and I'm just going to read it briefly. Um, so it says, whereas the compliance officers conclude that the city of Portland and the Portland Police Bureau have reached substantial compliance in the Department of Justice settlement in case yada 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 as laid out in their quarterly report dated October 3rd 2019 whereas steps have been taken by the Portland Police Bureau to address issues raised by the Department of Justice settlement they've crafted new engagement plans trainings and policies among other steps in doing so they have uh, included the public and PSEP in shaping these plans whereas while we the PSEP members believe these actions are a step in the right direction we believe an assessment of substantial compliance is premature there is not enough evidence to determine substantial compliance the assessment is based on outputs where the focus should be on outcomes whereas the Portland Police Bureau continues to make strides in improving relationships with marginalized communities there remains a large gap in trust with many marginalized communities of Portland including the African American community and in other communities of color, the houseless community and the mentally ill community, among others. The death of Andre Gladden highlights the deadly consequences of PPB's continued struggle to engage with persons of mental illness and African-American community members. Additionally, according to an Oregonian analysis in 2017, over 50% of the arrests by PPB officers were houseless individuals. The PPB's own data shows that half the use of force incidents in the last two years were of ho homeless pe houseless people. Furthermore, a 2018 city budget office report highlighted 
the disproportionate arrest of black students at Portland Public Schools. These are but a few of few statistics that highlight areas of concern that must be addressed if substantial compliance is to be affirmed. Um, whereas uh, assessment of paragraph 84 of the settlement agreement highlights scenarios and trainings implemented by PPB, which is the output, more time is needed to assess if this positively impacts behavior of officers, interactions with community members, the desired output. Um, and as Mr. Rosenbaum had stated, um, you know, it's too early to assess uh, if these things are actually working. Assessment of paragraph 89 acknowledges the work of the Unity Center to provide mental health services. The output, however, PSIP has concerns about the effectiveness of Unity Center to more adequately, to adequately support the needs of those suffering from mental illness, the outcome, and there's a uh, recommendation that we'll talk more about that further. More time is needed to work on the deliverables of these and other paragraphs of the settlement and agreement and show true and sustained success. Whereas the aforementioned statistics and questions cast doubt on the assertion of substantial compliance has been met, PPB and the City of Portland should continue their effort to better serve all communities of Portland and further articulate, articulate what success looks like. The compliance officer should further evaluate all sections of the settlement agreement and provide an update of the progress of PPB uh, on p progress of PPB in the city in their fourth quarter re report. Resolved that the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing, number one, disagrees with the assessment of compliance officer assessment of substantial compliance, recommends that the compliance officer further assess the sections of the quarterly report dated October 3rd, 2019, and allow more time for the outputs to demonstrate the desired outcomes. And number three, recommends that the Portland Police Bureau and the mayor more clearly articulate what their desired outcomes are based on the required outputs detailed in the Department of Justice Settlement Agreement. Therefore, be it resolved that the Portland Community and Community Engaged <coughs> Policing recommends that Chief Outlaw and Mayor Wheeler work with PSEP and other community partners to define what true substantial compliance looks like to the community of Portland. This can be um, done by articulating clear outcomes, as was mentioned numerous times tonight, that align with the outputs as established in the settlement agreement that are acceptable to both PPB and the community in order to establish substantial compliance. We further recommend the compliance officer to defer assessment of substantial compliance until further progress can be evaluated. Um, below is a summary of that recommendation in more uh, easier to read terms. Patrick. Um, we have Meredith Mathis here tonight to speak to us about our two recommendations and I do want to recognize Mark Shore and Timothy Russell both of our both members of our subcommittee thanks for being here we can't hear you we can't is that better okay there you go all right um, so we have two recommendations uh, both related to item 89 uh, but they're uh, they're separate but both connected uh, and so Kokel had stated that the Portland Police Bureau and the city of Portland have substantially complied with item 89, which specifically um, details that a drop-off walk-in center uh, be established. Uh, and they had listed the reason for compliance being that the um, Portland Police Bureau and the city of Portland have effectively partnered with the Unity Center for Behavioral Health. Um, so the first issue uh, is that Unity is not a walk-in center. It's not just that it's not a sufficient walk-in center, it's that it is, by definition, not a walk-in center. Um, it is a hospital-level psychiatric emergency service. It was never intended to be a walk-in center. Um, we have a list of bullet points we provided in the recommendation itself uh, that, has, that we want COCOL to consider. One of them, um, is the memo that was written by Daryl Walker, the chief executive officer of Cascadia, and Jeffrey Eisen, uh, the chief medical officer at Cascadia, in which they detail from an experienced professional perspective what constitutes a walk-in center. Um, and they specifically distinguish that from the, uh, a hospital-level psychiatric emergency service. That is what Unity is. Um, in addition to that, uh, we ask that COCOL consider the safety issues that have arisen um, at Unity. There have been well-documented instances of patient death, uh, patient-on-staff assault. There have been OSHA complaints, uh, OSHA citations, abuse investigations. Um, and we ask that COCOL consider this, that if, um, if Unity is 
overwhelmed and had so much dysfunction that because of this, there were many days where Unity had to be on diversion. So if, a pol so if police wanted to send somebody experiencing um, a mental health crisis to Unity, it would have to be diverted to another hospital. Uh, Um, so, and then in addition to that, uh, we ask that COCO look at the testimony provided from persons who have been patients at Unity Center. Um, okay. And we've noted that police officers can have people experiencing a mental health crisis transported by ambulance to Unity Center, but multiple reports show patients often escalate in this process leading to more police involvement and an escalation in force, resulting in arrest, incarceration, or forced hospitalization. Overloaded with patients, Unity has frequently diverted patients to be boarded in hospital emergency rooms, forcing behavioral health care providers to find other options. Multiple reports describe Unity alone as an insufficient response for persons in a mental illness crisis in our city. We urge that COCO reevaluate and update its classification of item 89 of the settlement agreement. And Dr. Rosenbaum did note um, that the settlement agreement doesn't have to do necessarily with outcomes and that we have to look at the actual language of the settlement agreement. Uh, but I think it's safe to say that um, in ID item 89, the United States expects that there will be a walk-in center and drop-off center established, and so Portland police and the city of Portland can't exactly comply with that, uh, working with that if it doesn't exist. Um, okay, and then the second recommendation we have uh, is a way that the city of Portland um, can comply potentially with item 89. Uh, and that would be to support uh, the Multnomah County Resource Center that is being developed. There was a lot of focus from Dr. Rosenbaum about uh, the scope of responsibility and what the Portland police can do. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of mention of the city of Portland's responsibility. Um, and even in the uh, description of why item 89 was found in compliance, it had to do with the Portland Police's attendance to transportation subcommittees at Unity. Um, it didn't mention the city of Portland's involvement um, in establishing a walk-in center. Um, so from our recommendation to support the resource center, no negotiations by the city were started with HealthShare Oregon, the current CCO, or with Multnomah County, the sole provider for, of funding for services for people on Medicaid seeking medical treatment for mental illness or addiction. Um, so to that extent, the scope of what the city can do in relation to the settlement um, has not been met. So capital development is well underway and documented elsewhere for the developing center. Um, remaining are operating costs. It's likely most or all of this ongoing cost uh, will need to come from county general funds and not CCO state or federal resources. A substantial area of cost is payroll for peer delivered services, including engagement, peer support, security, quality assurance and training and management. After attending county planning sessions, we estimate peer services will be about 25% of operating costs for the resource center. So the subcommittee for people with mental illness recommends the city of Portland contribute 25% of the operating costs for the res resource center. Um, and that would meet, the resource center would meet the, oh, you still need Is it on? Is it on? Uh, no, you can use that one over there. I think it's back on. It's back on. Woo! <laughs> back. Okay. 
Uh, well, I'm just wrapping up anyway, but um, we're recommending that the city of Portland contribute 25% of the operating costs for the resource center. Um, and the resource center uh, would meet the definition of a walk-in center um, as well as afford the city of Portland the opportunity to um, take responsibility for that item of the settlement um, and be found in compliance. Okay, I'll wrap it up there. Thanks. Thank you. Could you Thank say you your Meredith. name one more time, please? Meredith Mathis. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you. Um, we're going to open this up to two rounds of comments, one from PSEP. It'll last 10 minutes to 8.20, and then we'll have um, public comment from 8.20 to 8.30 and do our votes um, right at 8.30. Um, this will be open to all four recommendations that were just presented. And whoever wants to start from PSEP. I'm good. Um, oh, do we just want to go down the line? Let's yeah. ask Vadim then if he's on the line, if he wants to give Vadim, are you still here? Yes, I'm still there. Do you have any comments on the four recommendations? Can let him know he's on the line. Um, I, I, I do have comments on the recommendation with respect to substantial compliance. Um, can, can I be heard by the um, microphone right now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, so with respect to the substantial compliance recommendation put forth, um, uh, with respect to uh, having the uh, COCO uh, review again, uh, whether the city and the police department are within police bureau are within substantial compliance, I think the terms of the of what a substantial compliance means is laid out in the settlement agreement, um, and it's um, it, you know it specifically says that substantial compliance is achieved if any violation of agreements are minor or occasional and not systemic. Um, I, I would like to hear more information um, at some point in time as to why there's a disagreement um, as to whether the, the violations, if any, are systemic um, versus what the compliance officer found was that um, they're not systemic and um, uh, happen from uh, more of a minor occasion. So because it is a settlement agreement, because the terms are outlined within the settlement agreement, and because it's really up to the Justice Department to agree or disagree with the uh, uh, compliance officer's recommendation, um, I'm not sure to what extent the recommendations that PSEP can make for the compliance officer to review uh, whether there has been sufficient compliance is is in keeping with the settlement agreement or with the fact that the Justice Department has the uh, ultimate last word in uh, whether substantial compliance has been met. Um, I think we should, uh, if we disagree with any finding on the compliance officer, I think it's more incumbent upon us to point out those disagreements and uh, present those either before the court or to the Justice Department in their evaluation rather than... Um, instructing the compliance officer to reevaluate what, uh, based on the compliance officer's discussion today, is basically five years' worth of evaluations. Um, I'm not sure that will be fruitful down the road, so just please keep that in mind when uh, uh, making your votes, and if anybody has a view on that, I, I would love to hear that view. Thank you. Thank you, Vadim. Britt? So um, I actually do have something in response to Vadim. I think the um, what we've heard tonight from the compliance officer is that it they don't have the data. It's too early to tell what the outcomes are. So given that, if it's too early to tell, then I believe that means it's too early to determine that there's been substantial compliance. Because as I read the agreement, there would need to be some connection between the outputs, what, having meetings and training, and what that um, ends up in, or else this agreement, act, the settlement agreement means absolutely nothing, and I do believe it means something. And so if we've heard from the compliance officer that in fact they don't have that data, I think it is incumbent upon us to point that out and suggest that we wait until we have the data to show whether there has been substantial compliance and um, and th I would also note that this recommendation is addressed to Chief Outlaw and Mayor Wheeler in addition to the compliance officer, and it is the role of the PSEP 
in our charge to communicate to Chief Outlaw and Ma Mayor Wheeler about um, about precisely about the settlement agreement. So I think this is completely within our realm of responsibilities and everything I've heard tonight um, convinces me even more that we should vote yes. Thank you, Elliot. Amy? Um, the only thing I have concern about is um, whether or not um, number 89 really belongs to us or whether it belongs to the CCOs because it does state that the United States expects that the local CCOs will establish by mid-2013 one or more of the uh, drop-off centers for first responders. And if you'd have been around like I was back in the design of the CCO in this conversation with Unity, it was more or less to give the police officers a place where they could legally take clients without having to have a referral system. Mm -hmm. So Unity was built so that it could be an instant place for police to take folks in serious crisis to get care without having to go through the standard referral process for getting into these inpatient beds. So I just want everybody to know this recommendation still stands with the CCOs being responsible, which is not a city event. So I just want everybody to be aware of that. Thank in you. Res in, in response, I'd like to note that we're responsible for the entire document, uh, the settlement agreement. We're not responsible for certain specific items. Um, the only things I would add to the, the mental um, illness subcommittee recommendation when it says two members of PSIP, I think we should just put it to, and I know this is really technical, but I think it should just go to who we're trying to go give it to. So okay. I would in the future recommend saying it goes to um, uh, Mayor Wheeler and those folks. And I, okay. can someone well, show me the other recommendation? I lost my copy oh, in the yeah. sea of papers. Two yeah. Uh, it's, no, we can't make recommendations directly to them, though we, we want to make them directly to you guys. Right. That, was, that was the discussion we had earlier. Okay. But, Okay. Um, um, the other part I would say, um, where did this other one go? Oh, yeah. In the second one, it said item 89 is arguably the most expensive and complicated thing of the settlement agreement. It has not been discussed by COAB or PSEP. I feel like that kind of just takes away a little bit from our from PSEP because you guys did discuss it within your subcommittee, and that is part of okay. PSEP. So I, I just think that that would just kind of detract from a little bit, so I would probably just scratch that line out. Um, other than that, I think both of them look great. Okay. I don't have any anything to add. Um, on the, uh, I just want to see where we stand with the uh, the funding for this uh, item eighty nine, that and with the new CCO two point um, the Medicaid. Uh, population goes to the CCOs and not to Monoma County. So um, I think it needs to be a little bit more research. And I wanted the uh, city attorney to kind of comment on the responsible party for this uh, and if we can ask for money and provide resources. The paragraph, as has been previously identified, really talks about what the CCOs will do. At the time, there was a real effort, and the city was agreeing in the settlement agreement to support that effort, but it does clearly delineate the settlement agreement terms, do say, as has been identified by Ms. Anderson, that that, that is the responsibility of the CCOs. And, and I'm just going to say this really briefly. The settlement agreement is a, a, a negotiated agreement, a contract between the city and the United States that was agreed to as to what those obligations were. It's like any other contract. So it needs, the, the city's obligations need to be measured, and, and it's the whole city, not just the Portland Police Bureau, the whole city is a, is, is a party to it. And so what I would argue and will argue is that the specific obligations that are set forth in the agreement are what need to be met for substantial compliance. 
And just to follow up on what Dr. Rosenbaum said, that does not mean that there is not a lot of additional work to be done. That does not mean that the PCEP should not identify and carry forward many things outside of the settlement agreement. But I think the question for you all as you look at this is, are you looking at the specific terms of the settlement agreement? And nothing in the settlement agreement, I would say, and I freely acknowledge I am the city's lawyer, right? So um, take that for what it is. I mean, that is my client. Um, but nothing in the settlement agreement obligates the city to fund community mental health services. That is not generally the function of a city. That's a function of community care organizations, the county, the state. Um, and so the city did commit to work toward uh, establishing those goals, but the city did not agree to assume those goals. Um, excuse me, before you leave, you mentioned that you agreed that the city agreed to support it, item 89, and you also called it a contract. Am I mistaken? Correct. Thank you. Good cross-examination. <laughs> <laughs> Are you finished, Lakeisha? Yeah, I just wanted to see where we stood to not make unreasonable goals. Perfect. Thank you. Andrew? Just one comment from me, and it's uh, and I appreciate the subcommittee bringing these and explaining them to us. So thank you. Um, I want to explain one of my no votes, will, which will be on the on the recommendation for the twenty five percent support. I, I previously uh, voted no on another recommendation on another topic, suggesting that Portland spend a certain amount of money in the millions of dollars on on a project. And the, the reason is that I think. Uh, there are an extraordinary number of public needs in this city, in this county, in the state, in the country. They exceed our revenues, and as a result, we have to make very difficult choices as a community together about what we prioritize. Uh, and I am not prepared from where I sit uh, to say that the city of Portland and, and the taxpayers uh, that include everyone in this room should support this at 25% or 45% or 0%. Um, uh, but uh, but rather uh, believe in the broader goal of uh, more adequately funding uh, and supporting mental health services. So I wanted to explain uh, why uh, I'm voting no on that one. Thanks. Thank you. And just so you know, we are into the 10 minutes of the community, but we're going to keep going just so we can get through everybody's comments. Yolanda? Uh, I don't have a question at this time. I just wanted to say thanks for um shortening the piece of recommendation proposal process for community members it's a lot easier to read and understand now thank you for that comment steve yes uh to i uh, appreciate the work on this and maybe i'll disagree with the uh, funding uh because it's such a crisis for our city the mental health crisis is it's is a it's a major crisis uh saying that and so they did some good work here uh regarding the actual uh you know, compliance. Uh, I think that, you know, I feel like legally, probably all the things have been met. The work of this committee is to go beyond what's legal and go beyond that. So I don't have a problem saying, yes, I, you know, you have met all, 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 the, all the requirements uh, in the settlement, except for the one about this committee's work with the uh, community engagement plan. I think, I don't feel really like, that's i think that not sure that we really did that that connected together with with the police like we should have and so i i would disagree with that because i that i have we have experience with that versus the others i we don't know about the other the other components but with that i think that we we uh you know we're given something and it kind of went through and now our job is to make sure that all those things actually uh come about and maybe get added to next time around. So that's the one that I, I struggle with. Agreed. Andrew, I, I just want to mention there that the sub the subcommittee on settlement agreement and policy hosted a, a forum with the police department about the community engagement plan. We asked questions about it. We brought recommendations to the full board. We passed those and they were integrated into the plan. Um, could we have done more? Sure. Um, but I, I just want to make sure that that we remember what exactly we have done in this arena. Thank you. Mr. Sachs, final word. Uh, I don't really have anything to add. I echo uh, <clears throat> what the city attorney said. 
and what Mr. Rosenbaum said. And um, I feel that according to the legality of the document, that substantial compliance has been met. And But that, again, doesn't mean that we are where we want to be. There's still a lot of work left to do. And the PSEP, Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing, to me, means being in, engaged with the police and vice versa, the community and the police engaged. That takes a lot of trust and uh, relationship building. And PSEP um, has to be a part of that and leading that. And uh, we still have a lot of work to do in that area. Thank you. We're going to open it up to 10 minutes of public comment. Um, just be mindful of time, but we'll try and get to as many folks as we can. Go ahead. Uh, please state your name. My name is Tim Ledwith. I'm a uh, housing case manager with uh, Transition Projects. And for the last few years, I worked as a residential advocate at our Will Lamott Center Shelter. Um, I would just like, I just wanted to comment that um, uh, earlier it was spoken that the working with the houseless was not within the uh, confines of the agree agreement, but um, from my perspective, working in the shelter system and working with houseless people, um, it's, when I first started the job, it, we, we, they would talk about how, oh, people with mental health crisis would fall through the cracks into our system. and. I learned quickly that no, it's more the opposite. It's there. There isn't a sufficient, play, as as was talked about with Unity, there isn't a su su sufficient alternatives. And occasionally, people fall out of the criminal justice system, the shelter system, and the streets into proper mental health care. Very seldomly, and usually they cycle right back. So, um, in terms of we, when when I when we are dealing with somebody with a mental health crisis at our shelter, which are not also not equipped to deal with them. Uh, we have, our options are call project, or call call the police, call 911, or call project respond, which is just calling project respond who comes with the police. Or sometimes, like the other day, they just called 911 for me. So, um, and I benefited one, uh, recently from a police officer who laid it out for me, like what, what, the, what was going to happen when we had multiple people in severe mental health crisis in the shelter, he, he said, well, you can let them uh, just tire out, or what, I'm, what, what will happen is violence. I, we will have to take this person who doesn't want to come, um, I'll have to call for backup, they could get hurt, my people can get hurt, and everyone's going to witness it. And, and I was like, those are, the two that, those are the two options? So I think that that system is incredibly broken, and I think that um, I, I don't see how house the working with the houseless popula po population doesn't fit within uh, the uh, agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm I'm Dan Handelman again with Portland Cop Watch. Um, before I forget, um, we have our newsletter here, which any of you who didn't get, please come see me and get it. Um, you have four recommendations. First one, vehemently oppose the proposal as is made. We sent a proposal to the steering committee that the majority should be a majority of seated members, not the people sitting in the room, but the number of people who are actually seated. So you're missing one now, so you only have 12. So right now, um, the, the number that, that uh, you need to pass should be uh, seven, I guess, still. But um, at the time you took that vote, one person hadn't gone through training, so there were only 10 seated members at that time. And then that would have passed with six votes as happened. The uh, end result is otherwise you can have four people on this committee out of 13 making decisions for the whole committee and saying, yes, this is what the PCCP believes. And I think especially given the diversity of people on this board, you should consider that is not an appropriate way to do the voting. So the, the, the reason that the number is so high and it's not just under state law and a majority of people are sitting at your table is to make sure that you're all, your voices are all included. Uh, the houseless data uh, is the only thing I have to com comment on in your second one. Um, I think it's an excellent thing to say this body, which is uh, supposed to independently assess the implementation of the agreement. You shouldn't be letting these people tell you you can't do that. You're doing what you're supposed to do. You're independently assessing it. 
Um, the only thing that's wrong is the houseless data, the IPR did their own report and they found out that the Bureau only has one thing to write in if somebody refuses to give their address. So some people who are listed as houseless may be just people who didn't give an address. So we don't know for sure that it's 50%. Yeah. I don't think you need to change it for that, but you should be aware of that as you're using that statistic. Mm -hmm. um, the third one, we agree with that one. Um, we have a whole section in our analysis about the Unity Center not being adequate walk-in drop-off center. And the fourth one is really out of our wheelhouse, so I'm not gonna comment on that. Um, the last thing, we're talking about whether violations are systemic or not, and I talked already about the police shootings. Um, if you look at the police review board reports, and I recommend that you use some hand sanitizer after you do. Uh, for an example of the kind of thing that's going on is that there was a case where the Citizen Review Committee found misconduct uh, for untruthfulness, uh, which would be lead to an automatic firing, and the chief subsequently to that, even though she said she agreed with her finding, changed the allegation to a performance problem. And so the officer was given, I think it was one day off, or either one or three days off without pay. So this is one instant, but this is a systemic problem if the chief can change what the, what the finding is at the end of this long investigation and the Citizen Review Committee appeal, and then she changes what the finding is. So I want you to look at that. I have some copies of our analysis here. We also tried sending it to you on email. Thank you. Dan, can I ask you a question? Um, the, the bylaws I have in front of me under voting say majority of seats. They don't say seated members. That's what I'm saying. I proposed to you that okay. you should change that to with the majority of seated members. Oh, okay. Right? That's what that's my recommendation that you change that proposal so that it recommends, you know, that it reflects that four people can't make a decision for 13 people. And and just for clarification, Elliot, your recommendation would change it to be majority of people who are at the meeting. Once a quorum is met, yeah, Once members is met. present at a meeting. Okay. But that wouldn't change necessarily anything here today. Any other public comment? Um, Alexa Simpson. Um, discussing financial responsibility being set in care of CCOs versus the, sh the city should be carefully examined as there's no checks and balance system in place to alleviate um, and prevent further displacement and gentrification. It falls upon the city to be held equally as responsible if demolition and development continues, leading to trauma and unresolved and compounding and ever-growing mental health diagnoses due to the lack of access to those resources. Thank you. Thank you. Is it okay if I make further comment? I don't know if it's... Absolutely. Okay. We've got about... Um, two minutes left. It's short, okay. Um, I just wanted to clarify, um, because people brought up, you know, that the CCOs were the main, were supposed to be the main responsible parties, and that's true, um, that is in the item directly. The reason um, I was focusing on the actual COCAL um, evaluation of compliance was because what they were saying made them in compliance was that the PPB was sufficiently partnering with the Unity Center for Behavioral Health. And so the fact that that compliance rested on the partnership is, um, is connected to uh, why we're putting it more on the city. Okay, just wanted to clarify that, thanks. Thank you. Any further public comment? Okay, any um, changes based on the feedback we just received to any of these four recommendations? All right, we are going to Go recommendation by recommendation and vote. Uh, you know, yeah. The the one the one recommendation that you you mentioned, I think we should we can change that. Uh, which one? Could you state it for us just so we know what you're talking about? Use your microphone too. Yeah, I am. Um, where was it? Oh, the the part about co or piece that being discussed. The uh, I you mean the bylaw one. Yeah, I That's can't. No, there's no, no, on that. no, the um, the one where you, you, we can just uh, remove piece up from that. Okay, the first sentence. Oh, yeah. Where it says item 89 is arguably the most expensive and complicated portion of the settlement agreement. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so that first sentence is striked from the. Um, no, just or piece up. I think. The, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so just strike piece up from it. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so this is recommendation on item 89, support for Multnomah County Resource Center. It's the one pager and uh, it reads, and yet it has not been discussed by COEB or PSEP and Patrick uh, is striking out or PSEP from that. So it would just read, has not been discussed by the COEB, period. <coughs> it, COEB. Okay, so we are going to vote on recommendation number one. Was there a title for that? Bylaw change? We'll just yeah. call it bylaw change. We're going to go right down the row starting with uh, Sam. Uh, so we want a yes, no, or abstain vote for recommendation on the bylaw change. Yes. Uh, Steve? Yes. Yolanda? Yes. Andrew? No. No. Lakeisha? No. Yes. Marcia? No. For me. Go ahead. Uh, I think uh, with the bylaws one, it's a little confusing because it was too many things thrown out. But as it was read. The ch yeah, the change would be that it's, it's whoever is present at the meeting. So if we have, yeah. it, barring quorum. Provided right? we have the quorum of yes. seven. Okay. So I just voted no, Amy? Yes. Elliot? Yes. Vadim? Yes. Britt? No. Patrick? Yes. Okay, so that passes with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight votes. Um, recommendation two, uh, recommendation to define outcomes for substantial compliance. We're gonna start with Steve. Steve? Oh, sorry, Sam? No. Steve? No. Yolanda? No. Andrew? No. Lakeisha? Abstain. Marcia? Abstain. Lakiana, yes. Amy? Yes. Elliot? Yes. Vadim? No. That was a no vote. Uh, Britt? Abstain. And Patrick? Yes. Okay, that was uh, voted down. It's one, two, three, four, five no's. One, two, three, four yeses. And three abstains. One, two, three abstains. Okay, recommendation three. Uh, this is the, I need that one again. Uh, Recommendation to reevaluate uh, reevaluation and update of item 89, starting with Sam. No. Uh, Steve? Yes. Yolanda? Yes. Andrew? Yes. Lakeisha? Yes. Marcia? Yes. Lakiana? Yes. Uh, Amy? I need a little clarification. Sure, go ahead. Um, What's the yes and no vote about? The the yes is saying that the uh, COCO should uh, reevaluate and update uh, their substantial compliance of item 89. Okay, then I vote yes. They should. Yep. Uh, Elliot? Yes. Vadim? No. It was a no vote. Britt? Yes. And Patrick? Yes. Okay, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No, that's more than that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten yeses and two noes. Uh, sorry, let me just record that. And then uh, uh, recommendation number four is. So just to be clear, that one passed. Correct. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, that Under one passed. Under any version of the bylaws. <laughs> yep. Uh, Support for Multnomah County Resource Center. Uh, that's a 25% that the city would uh, um, would pay for, starting with Sam. No. Steve? Yes. Yolanda? Yes. Andrew? No. Lakeisha? Abstain. Marcia? Yes. Lakiana? No. Amy? No. Elliot? Yes. Vadim? No. Britt? Yes. Patrick? Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let me just count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two
four, five, six. So that's six yeses. Uh, it does not pass. It needed seven. Um, so that's six yeses. We had one, two, three, four, five noes and one abstain. So just to uh, recap all of that, recommendation number one on the bylaw change passed with eight yes votes. Recommendation two on the uh, outcomes for substantial compliance did not pass. Recommendation three on the uh, um, reevaluation update of 89 did pass. And then recommendation four, uh, the support for Multnomah County Resource Center did not pass. So two bylaws passed, two did not. That is going to conclude Lock our meeting. I know that. Lock you Sorry, I'm getting multiple things. What's that? Um, yep, I know you wanted to say something. Vadim, were you about to say something? Okay, we're going to close it out with um, some words from Sam. Um, for those of you who do not know, tonight is my last meeting. I have resigned from the PSEP um, effective today. I submitted a resignation to Mayor Wheeler. Um, I thanked him for selecting me to be uh, a member of the initial PSEP. Uh, and in October is a time of reflection, the Jewish New Year, a time of reflection, renewal. And as I do every year, I reflect on my life, where I was, where I am, where I'm going. And uh, I really appreciate this work, the diversity, the uniqueness of the committee. I feel that it's in a great place, the leadership <coughs> moving forward. And I've, I'm, I'm honored to have been a part of it. My family's been here since the 40s, and my uh, goal and intent in serving on this committee is to give back to my community what it has given to my family since the 1940s. So it really has been a joy and an honor for me to serve. Um, there is no reason uh, for me stepping down other than it's a personal choice, and uh, as I look at my life and my passion, my effort, my energy, and what I want to do and where I want to put that, it's in different places not that this isn't meaningful or important, um, but there are other things in my life that I want to spend that time. Being a volunteer is very time consuming. And so I applaud everyone on here for your commitment, the relationships that we've had, um, you know, the communication. And I feel that um, you, you won't miss a beat uh, losing myself or anybody else. So I just wanna say that publicly and I thank everybody, the police bureau, the mayor, the community, uh, everybody that comes to these meetings, it's it's a real great process. Judith, Theo, Claudia, Mandy, Nicole, the support that you have given this committee as a city staff is really incredible. And through everything that we encounter, so I want to really thank you. And I think because of you, we are able to support, um, be, be supportive and, and operate the way we do. So um, thank you everyone. I'll still be around in town, but tonight is my last meeting, and uh, I wish you all the, the luck in the world. I, I did ask the mayor, thank you. <laughs> I did ask the mayor to um, consider replacing me with a person of color, woman, or person of disability. That is my choice, and I've asked him to consider it. Of course, the mayor will make his decision. Would you like to vote on that recommendation? I'm sorry? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Can we vote on that? Yeah, thank sure. you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for your service. Thank you. That concludes our October meeting. Have a good night. <coughs>